Anyway, um, we could uh, call a meeting order and uh, actually stand and pledge the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Clinton Barris. Here. Joe Weatherby. Here. Chris Burr. Here. Carolyn McLaughlin. Here. Jeff Kramer. Justin Bruin. Jack Gerlett. Here. Bruce Ferrer. Here. Ben Dotson. Linda Kruska. Dave Vandenbosch. Here. George Barrett. Tad Burr. Will Denson. Here. Mimi Stafford? Here. David Hotchop? John Kincaid? Here. Bob Smith? Here. Stephen Leopold? Pete Brezza? Here. David Makepeace? Here. Susie Roland? Here. Corey Malcolm? Here. Rob Mitchell? Elena Rodriguez? Martin Moe? Here. Alex Grosky? <coughs> Ken Niedermeyer? Yep. Jessica Dockery. George Nugent. Here. Andy Newman. Eric Hanty. Bruce Popham. Here. Ken Redden. David Vaughn. Shelly Kruger. Here. Ed Barham. Here. Kenny Blackburn. Steve Blackburn. Bill Goodman? Here. Major Alfred, Alfredo Escano? Captain David Dupre? Rob Bacon, representing David Dupre. Thank you. John Hunt? Here. Heather Blau? Joanna Walzak? Here. Christopher Cavanaugh? <coughs> Honorable Jerry Ellis? Honorable Chris Cole? Honorable Norman Anderson, Honorable Mike Forster, Honorable Craig Gates. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I entertain a motion to approve the minutes of last meeting. Who is that? So 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 Second. 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 Uh, <coughs> Second. Any discussion, any amendments, any changes to the minutes? Anybody? Um, any opposition to opposing or to approving them? See any? <coughs> Consider them approved. Um, <coughs> entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for today. One, one quick thing is, is the regional report is going to be an extended regional report today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I get a motion? Uh, All right. Mimi, second. 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 Uh, Chris Burke, I know it's technicality. Uh, there is one of the <coughs> amend, uh, change to the motion or to the agenda, and that's just an extended discussion from the regional manager. Any other comments on the agenda? All right. Move forward. Um, just a few little details. Uh, again, we're we're street streaming live, is that true? Or we're being taped? Yes. yes. Both. We're, we're live and being taped thanks to keys.com <coughs> and Clinton Barris. Thank you. Uh, that means try to wait for a microphone to speak. I know that sometimes it's easier just to ad hoc talk out loud and make things happen, but uh, you can wait. Mary will be running up and down with microphones and she will hand them to you live. Yes. So don't go pushing any buttons to try to turn them on or on. And, uh, I know it's hard, but anyway, you do that. Um, also, if you have cell phones, which everybody does, please turn them on mute or turn them off. And if you could avoid uh, surfing the web while we're having a meeting, that'd be good. I mean, if you're here to pay attention to what we're doing, not you know, checking emails and shopping on eBay, so you want to pay attention. Uh, we've just gone through a, a series of SAC recruitment. Uh, whatever we do. Uh, there's nine different positions that are open. 
and uh, they've all been applied for. We've reviewed the applicants, and uh, we're sending our recommendations up to headquarters, wherever that is, up in the uh, PC area. And we should know by the next meeting who the new uh, appointees are, and we can move forward with that. Anybody in the audience, if you want to make public comment, we have uh, two different public comment days times today. One is 11.15, one is at 2 o'clock. These are for items uh, not necessarily on the agenda. If you want to talk about an agenda item, that's fine too, but if there's something else you want to talk about, that's a great time. Uh, there's comment cards. I think they're outside of this table right up here, so try to fill that out and give it to Beth or myself. Uh, we should take a break right before public comment so that we get time to submit it, but anytime you bring it up here, that's fine. You can also submit written comments, and those comments are distributed to the SAC. You can submit a comment to a SAC member, and those are usually distributed. They should be distributed to <laughs> the rest of the SAC. Um, so anyway, we want you know, to hear what you have to say. This is a, you know, a public process for all volunteers. We don't get paid to be here, and it, it, you know, we're representing uh, different uh, interest groups, but we're also listening to what other people have to say, so don't hesitate to to comment on different things. Um, I'm supposed to have the chairman's comments at the beginning. That's kind of all I really have to say. There's a lot going on. Um, anybody that spends any time in the water knows that we, we're in the middle of a pretty severe bleaching event. And a lot of things going on with it. A lot of things cause that. The, what's happening in Florida Bay is partially to blame. Uh, El Nino is partially to blame. Climate change is partially to blame. And then just the weather that we had for the last three months was to blame. So there's a lot of reasons why we're undergoing a lot of stress on the coral reef right now. Uh, it's, you know, the worst is behind us, but uh, we still got a lot of, a lot of problems out there, a lot of problems in coral in uh, Florida Bay, which many of you probably read about. We'll probably talk a little bit about that today, and uh, I think the December agenda is gonna talk quite a bit more about what's going on in Florida Bay. Um, so that, Beating that up too much, um, I'd like to introduce the first presenter. It's uh, Bill Goodwin. <coughs> Where's Master Bill? Here I am. So, um, I whether I should it. so Bill, Bill's been with the sanctuary since forever. Uh, yeah, it was the earth was still cool. Yeah. At that point, uh, and he's still so here. Billy was there even before that. Uh, was a, you know, cl a cloud of dust and gas at that point. <laughs> I'm not talking about you, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, how, what about this wind? I mean, this is crazy. I left the house this morning and I had a full head of hair. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure, why not? Okay, do it if you want. Um, you know, Mark Twain once said, I have seen people who were slower than me and people who were shyer and quieter than myself. And I've even seen people who are more listless and lazy than I am, but they were dead. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with the show. It's just my favorite Mark Twain quote that I thought I'd share with you guys. Anyway, I'm here to uh, talk about a really nifty, if a, a rest, coral restoration can be nifty, this one qualifies, um, restoration that uh, the FKNMS staff did this summer. And uh, it involved uh, damage from a uh, aid to navigation buoy, the Crocker Reef uh, buoy number 16. And it was a very uh, satisfying um, project because it involved a lot of our staff and it was just a great uh, uh, team effort. Okay, next. Oh, oh, I'm doing that. <laughs> Golly, Keith. What happens? There's a bunch of buttons. Just keep pushing. It's awesome. I'm just going to push stuff for some yeah. Japanese calls. <laughs> you only get one side. Here you go. Okay. Uh, just to give you an idea of the range of projects that we've been involved with with the sanctuary, uh, this is what I would call a double extra large. This is uh, uh, the Wellwood. It was a... Uh, uh, 122 meter freighter that went aground on molasses and this is what it did you can see it just pretty much leveled everything to just a flat pavement Don't go on it which one is it 
I got yeah. it. Okay. Oh, okay. And a, uh, a grounding of this size requires uh, a lot of planning, a lot of materials. Um, it was a huge monumental effort. Um, it involved uh, hard hat divers, cranes, uh, reef replacement modules. It was a, uh, a big project. Next. And that's what it looks like today. I think it turned out pretty well. One of our uh, most successful restoration, large-scale restoration projects. Um, you can see now it's covered with gorgonians, sea fans, uh, coral and algae, and a lot of Ken Niedermeyer's uh, <laughs> nursery corals on certain designated <coughs> modules, okay? And this would be the other end of the spectrum. This is a, kind of a micro restoration. And um, uh, this was a recent grounding at South Carey's Fort. And we reattached about a um, couple of dozen um, small parietes, asteroides, mustard hill coral, uh, corals uh, back onto the reef. So that would be, that's really small, extra small, and extra, extra large. So the project I'm talking about today is what I would consider kind of a medium-sized project. And it's this guy here, the Crocker Reef Aid to Navigation Buoy Number 16, which is kind of a mouthful. So we've, in the office uh, and government, you know, penchant for acronyms, we just shortened it to the Craton. So when I talk about the Craton, that's what I'm talking about is this big, uh, steel buoy, the craton. It sort of sounds like a Greek mythological creature, the craton. <laughs> and uh, that's where it normally resides at Crocker Reef. Um, and that uh, buoy is not to scale, by the way. Uh, neither are the other <laughs> buoys either. Okay, next. And so, um, somehow, some way, uh, the buoy became unmoored. Hit, hit the button. Oh. Beth? Ooh, wow. And it drifted six months. We spared no expense to bring you the best in computer aided graphics. Um, it uh, drifted six miles west uh, and collided with a really nice little patch reef that's just um, about 500 yards seaward of Chica Rocks. Okay? And uh, we were actually alerted to this uh, situation by some researchers from the AOML lab. Um, and uh, actually, they contacted Joanne Delaney first, and then she passed that information on to us. So we went out and conducted a biological assessment. And this line here represents the uh, injury track as the buoy made its way across the reef. And that track was 64.5 uh, meters in length, or approximately 212 feet. So it was a long track. Next. And the injuries uh, that, uh, that this thing caused, uh, lots of abrasion of the live tissue of coral. We saw that throughout the whole grounding track. Next. Uh, lots of crushing and fracturing of uh, coral colonies. This is a uh, Orbicella annularis or mountain of star coral colony and there it's got kind of a clubby <coughs> rose habit so when it got hit they, they sort of just fell apart and also there's a lot of parietes uh, finger coral in this area a lot of that got damaged as well. Next. Oh. Starting nice. And there was a lot of toppling of uh, large coral colonies like this uh, uh, mountainous star coral. And uh, there were quite a few of those in the injury path as well. Next. And there was a lot of uh, just dead coral framework rubble that was generated. And this is something that we see in a lot of coral grounding cases. And it's always, it's always troubled me what, what to do with the rubble. Um, in some cases, we've actually just scraped it away and hauled it off. And other, other cases, we've 
covered it over you know, with various things to try and keep it in place. But I, I, always, I always wanted to come up with something to do with it. So, next. One day I was in Home Depot uh, in the garden shop and I saw these plastic pond liners uh, stacked up and they had kind of a nice irregular shape and I thought, gee whiz, if I turned one of these things over and cut the, well, if I cut the bottom out of it and flipped it over, I might be able to use that as a form to put rubble in and try and, you know, re-aggregate it. So uh, my idea was to pin it to the bottom with rebar and then put uh, fiberglass rebar on the inside and then fill it with cement and rubble and kind of adorn it on the top with uh, live corals and more rubble. And there's the first one that we did, that was uh, at a small grounding site called the What Doing in 2009. And next, and that's what it looked like when we got through with it. Um, it was the first one we'd ever done, and I've changed the methodology a little bit. We, we use a lot more rubble and a lot less cement now, so it, they look more natural. But I think it turned out pretty, pretty well. Next. So we developed a uh, restoration plan and cost estimate documents, which we sent up to uh, sanctuary headquarters to get approval to spend out of a uh, general coral restoration fund and uh, this was our estimated price tag to, to fix this $78,149 it ain't cheap to fix coral Next. so once the uh, um, money was approved or the, the funds were approved we purchased materials uh, put a date on the calendar when we wanted to, to do the work, uh, worked out logistics of staff and diving and whatnot. It was, it was kind of a kind of a nightmare getting it all pulled together, but it, it came together thanks to uh, people like Mary and uh, Beth and and Steve actually shook the money tree for us and got that money. So uh, they're all to be commended. So. Whoop. Oh, back up just for a second so that we uh, uh, our mooring buoy team uh, was good enough to lend us their boat uh, their uh, mooring buoy maintenance vessel the Agassiz as a work platform and uh, also to help us with uh, actually doing the work and there's the those are the, the pond form liners there and as you can see it takes a lot of a lot of stuff to fix coral a lot of, lot of equipment. Okay. So we get out to the site and the first order of business is to move the uh, rubble and live coral over to the area where we're going to reattach all this material. Uh, we, we decided not to try and put it back exactly where it was in the entry path because that part of the reef was very porous and had a lot of rugosity and we felt like the cement was just going to kind of <coughs> flow down into the reef and go to China before it held on to anything. So fortunately there was a really nice flat hard bottom area uh, just off the reef and uh, there were already small uh, coral, well, <coughs> small patches of coral and lots of gorgonian so it made for what we thought would be a nice, natural, uh, similar setting for these, these corals, and it would be a real stable place to put them. So we started moving the rubble and the uh, coral over to that hard bottom area. Nice. And uh, my colleagues from uh, the Key West office brought with them this, uh, uh, it's a uh, rescue litter net thing that they, have on their boat for pulling an injured diver or swimmer back into the boat. And it worked like a champ for moving uh, coral. Uh, we were able to put lots of small corals in it and put a lift bag on the net and move it over to the staging area. Next. And it was also uh, really handy for moving large corals because 
we had some pretty big uh, coral colonies to, to, to move and um, it was, again, it was just, uh, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread for, for moving those things. Next. So, uh, before we started reattaching the corals, there was a, quite a bit of prep work that needed to be done. A lot of the, the colonies have these long, irregular shaped dead bases uh, that we needed to, that we trimmed off so that they would um, not be so top heavy and, you know, make a better contact with the, uh, the cement and the seafloor. And, uh, and of course, in the process of that, that also generated uh, even more rubble. So we had lots of rubble to work with. Um, and uh, this is uh, a diver pre preparing the site of attachment, which, you know, the seafloor is covered, has a coating of algae usually. And so we scrape that or scratch that off with fire brushes and then install uh, concrete masonry cut nails and that gives a, um, the concrete that we use a, a more of a uh, surface to, to grab onto and stay in place. Okay. So most of the uh, broken and dislodged corals wound up being attached just directly to the uh, hard bottom substrate. Next. But uh, we also, uh, we had our, our modules to build, and that's, the, that's sort of the process there. You got the module pinned to the bottom with threaded um, rod, and then on the inside we installed uh, fiberglass rebar, and um, then uh, took the, uh, moved the royal, uh, not royal, moved the rubble over to the module, put it in the module, and pretty much filled it with rubble and then started pouring the cement into the, the form around the rubble. And then, uh, last but not least, while the cement was still wet, we put even more rubble in on top of the, the wet cement so it had a nice, rough, um, natural looking uh, upper surface to it. Okay? <laughs> and uh, this is <laughs> the. the the uh, ugly side of coral restoration, the dirty, messy side, and but it's it's the most important, well, well, probably the most important aspect in terms of uh, getting the job done is the top side support and people who know how to make cement and how to work hard and and uh, um, make make our make the materials for us that we use. Um, I wouldn't mess with those guys. They look pretty tough. And that's a, that's a little portable cement mixer, by the way, that we, uh, we use. And uh, uh, these guys actually kind of have like this love affair with it. <laughs> it's a little weird, but they, they love that thing. Okay. So after a few days of letting the, the module set and cure, um, they, uh, you know, they're ready to, ready to be uh, unveiled. If you'll notice, um, Notice here's a uh, stainless steel eye bolt that we installed on one of the modules and a piece of big, uh, that large piece of rubble, and that serves as a centralized permanent monitoring uh, monument, and we can use that to clip uh, meter tapes into to, to you know take measurements and distance and bearings to all the reattached corals so that we can find them in the future. Okay? So it's time to pull the forms off and see what we have. Next. And that's pretty much the final product after all the coral, after the modules were made and the corals were reattached. Um, and uh, you can see uh, quite a few corals were um, attached directly to the modules, um, but then most of them are sort of scattered around it. And uh, if you, I don't, I don't really have a, a photograph of the, you know, the natural part of that area, but it, it mimics it pretty well. And the fish seem to like it. We had 
hordes of uh, angelfish and all kinds of... We actually had a pot of dolphins come by and check us out while we were working there. That was kind of cool. Okay? And then uh, the day after the, uh, we completed the project, we conducted the, uh, what we call the baseline monitoring event which was, you know, your, your very first monitoring um, so that you have it as a, you know, reference for future monitorings. And um, the, uh, the monitoring schedule is, uh, after the baseline, is um, three, six, one, no, I'm sorry, one year, th one, three, six, and ten years after uh, completion of the project. So we'll be monitoring this for 10 years, okay? And that's uh, my equivalent of a sunset photo for the end of the presentation. So anyway, any questions? Yes, sir. Do I need a mic? Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Uh, you say this is live? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many uh, roughly? personnel hours do you figure you put into this and if you can you divide in preparation and on, on site wow uh, well that's a little tough to say because we, you know there was the response the assessment for writing the assessment writing a restoration plan buying all the materials and, and in white you know, county a number of staff so it was hundreds of hours yeah uh, easily. I mean, Steve, you might know the exact. Uh, I guess you had, you had six six folks working on ten hour days for, mm -hmm. for 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 two weeks for two weeks. And that was just on. And that was just that was the that was just the pro actually doing the field. Like you're on site. That was the on couple time. weeks. <laughs> two two weeks. Yeah, two weeks with ten, uh, ten people. So ten sixty people. hours, sixty man hours a day for two weeks just to do restoration. So you managed to spend the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and probably then some. We don't. We're not quite sure yet. Yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, out of the two hundred, <laughs> roughly two hundred meters that was verified, about how big was the area that you? Um, I guess you went to a an area to mitigate, or, or not in any of that area. Um, how big that was? How many of those modules you did? And I'm fascinated also by the mud mixer. And um, um, how, I mean, I guess you guys maybe know this, but how do you get that to set up? Like, do you put special additives in the concrete? Like, that's weird. That's crazy. No, it just, it just sets up on its own underwater. We have, I mean, there are additives you can put in, in cement to make it uh, set faster. You can put molding plaster in it, and it'll set, it'll harden in a, just a matter of a, a, a few minutes. And if you know if you if you want to do work, say in a high energy environment, and you know you don't want to just sit there and have to hold a coral in place for you know an hour or so while the cement sets up, you can put these additives in it. But you get, um, you also get a very short work time. And the other answer, the other question, there were two two modules, all, all week. but we used all the rubble. It was. Uh, I don't know volumetrically how much it was, but it was each module took two square meters worth, you know, looking at a bird's eye view, two square meters worth of rubble went into each one. Yes, John. Well, I, I, I have a question kind of on the fate of, of parallels from this kind of restoration. Um, you've done a lot of restorations over the years, and I've, and I've always been curious if the fate of the Corals that are damaged or broken that you actually had to use in the restoration mm -hmm. um, is the same or different from the nearby corals that are undamaged. Now, in, in other words, do those corals that are, are broken that you restore experience bleaching more readily in the lower temperature, or do they have a higher rate of disease? Or you know something like that, or is their experience, if you will, the same as all the all the other corals? Um, they. The short answer is 
yes, they pretty much behave the same as the surrounding reef. Um, I, we've been to this site since uh, the bleaching started this summer, and of course the corals we've reattached, they, they have bleached, pale, whatnot. Um, uh, I know um, that in past uh, restoration projects, um, it's roughly about a 75% survival rate. That's what we, what we get. And um, in fact, one of the reasons why it took uh, a full year for us to do this project was because by the time we had done the, the original assessment and got things uh, in order to, uh, you know, to, to do the work, we had the bleaching of 2014 and uh, all the injured coral was bleached and we just, we felt like it was just too much undue stress to try and move them around and, re you know, handle them that much while they were stressed out. So we waited until they, they had recovered from that. So, um, unfortunately, we didn't have any major storms or hurricanes or anything, so pretty much all stayed in place until we were able to reattach it. Yes? I'll just stand up and talk about it. Here, here, here. Yes. <coughs> Those stress portals that you've replanted, how did they handle this summer's stress? Those replanted in the summer. They, well, they were, they were fine in July when we, when we reattached them, but they have bleached just like the other, the surrounding reef. In to various degrees. Uh, other, um, another uh, project similar to this, um, when we had the, the cold event of 2010, um, those corals all died just like you know, a lot of the other patch reef, the un, uninjured corals. So they, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty much, I don't know if they're more affected by uh, in, uh, adverse conditions, but I think once once they get once they've been there a while and they get reestablished, I, I think they're they're you know no more prone to to disease or bleaching or any any of those sorts of things than an uh, uninjured coral. So okay, no more questions. How about some answers? Is, yeah, is there a responsible party for the? Coast Guard uh, and I, knew you were going to I, was, I thought I was going to get away. Yeah, um, that's that buoy is maintained by the U.S. Coast Guard. But um, and uh, uh, Coast Guard does a lot of good things, and we felt like it would it would be. Uh, uh, a, a good gesture on our part to, to, to do this and you know, accidents happen. So, yes? Bill, I can't, I can't help but uh, put in a, a little <coughs> ad for AML. Uh, in one of your slides you showed them the buoy at its final, at 16 at its resting spot. And right next to it was a yellow buoy. Yeah. I don't know if the advisory council knows, but that's one of the uh, CO2 monitoring stations for ocean acidification. And uh, it's one of two we have in the Keys. Yeah, I'm... Yeah, there, there it is. You just go oh, back. Oh. Right yeah, this, this guy here. There's, yeah, there's the, the craton and there's uh, the um, CO2. I thought it was put there by an extra for us for I was wrong. Any other questions? All right. Phil, great job. Thank you. Sean, did you want to introduce the next speaker? Or is he here? Okay, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule and uh, 
next, uh, we, can, we can skip and leave it. All right. That's yours then. Yes. All right. Jump ahead just a little bit. All right. Um, quick, quick introduction as we kind of marry and then both of us. Um, so as, as we've been talking about the last couple of meetings, uh, you know, this year is our 25th anniversary uh, for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, but in um, November of uh, 1990. And, and so uh, we've been talking about a, a couple different things that we're, uh, we're going to have going. It's really kind of a kickoff of, uh, it, it's going to be kind of a year-long uh, piece of work that we're, we're going to be doing a, a lot of different things. but. But for the anniversary itself, uh, we're going to uh, have two items. Uh, one is on the evening of November 7th. That's the, the dinner you've all been invited to. Um, I hope everyone can make it. Uh, we're uh, we're going to resend out the, the, the invitation because uh, we do need RSVPs. Uh, this is going to be a, a really good time at uh, the Islander uh, on the evening of Saturday, November 7th. So hopefully everyone can make it. Um, we've got uh, from, from NOAA, the, the NOAA Chief of Staff, Renee Stone, is going to be coming down, uh, as well as a couple other folks from the program, um, as, as well as from partner agencies. Uh, so I uh, encourage folks to come to that. As well as on Sunday, November 8th, uh, we're going to have kind of a family fun day. Uh, also at the Islander, the Islander kind of Guy Harvey Resorts has just been a fantastic partner on this. Um, and uh, that's where we could actually uh, use a little bit of help. And so um, we're going to turn it over to Mary for this point, okay. and, then, and then she's going to go through some of the, the things. Thanks, Sean. I think I stole probably. Yeah, I'm not yeah. So. You know, Billy used to do it to me, too. Okay. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. Tell me, Ted, Mary's our Team Ocean coordinator. Let me tell you all about Team Ocean. And he'd tell the whole thing, and then he'd say, well, Mary, take it away. And it was always like, all right, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> um, and it's going to be real real quick. Um, so I just want to, I know Sean talked about it being our 25th anniversary, but I also wanted to mention that um, it's kind of a uh, really super big year for those of you that know the history of the sanctuaries here in the Keys, is that in December it will be the 40th anniversary of the Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary, and then in January it will be the 35th anniversary for Lou Key. Um, however, we are building this, of course, since we are the Florida Keys now, as the 25th anniversary of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, but it really does go back um, for uh, um, quite a while um, here in the Keys. Yeah, it's not just Bill. <laughs> Beth, help me out here. The history? No, the button. Oh, it won't go. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So as Sean said, on uh, Saturday, November 7th, um, we're kicking off that evening with a dinner at the uh, Islander Resort at Guy Harvey Art Post. Um, 5.30 cocktails, cash bar, hors d'oeuvres, and then a uh, buffet dinner. So raise your hand if you got the invitation. Right, so make sure it's not going to your spam. It came from an email called florida.keys.nl.gov. That was actually the first email that had ever gone out from that account. Um, so it's a little bit of a different account. I was a little concerned it might have gone to folks' spam folder um, because it's not coming from a direct person. It's called one of our service accounts and all. Um, we did um, just put in what the dress code was on the invitation, so dress is Keys casual. Um, but uh, um, I will send that back out again, and uh, uh, we have a, a few of you up there on the room. I see that you've got RSVP, um, but hopefully more of you can join us. Beth. And just to give you an idea, here's the, the buffet. Um, peel and eat shrimp, you know. Um, roasted tamarind barbecue pork loin, grilled sour orange and garlic chicken, and sauteed catch of the day, and includes dessert and all stuff, so it should be pretty good. The next day um, is we are hosting a family fun festival at the Islander Resort, and it's going to be made up of a couple different things. From 1 to 5, we are going to have a conservation village, <coughs> which is um, booths from different um, organizations, agencies, um, right on the beach um, at the Islander. And uh, hopefully they will all be having, and the, the, as they come in, they'll have activities. So it's not just a booth where you come and pick up brochures, but we'll actually have kids' activities um, and fun things to do. Uh, the Islander will be providing live music 
So you just want to come hang out on the beach at the Islander. It should be pretty fun. They'll have live music. Um, they have a pig roast and then other food and beverages for purchase. So that's from 1 to 5. During that time, from 2 to 4, we will also be doing a free kids fishing clinic. Um, so the fishing clinic um, will consist of, we'll have different stations, uh, casting, knot tying, um, ethical angler, FWC is bringing their touch tank, um, and then of course fishing. And it is free, and each angler will receive a free rod and reel, which has been donated by the Anamarada Charter Boat Association's Keys um, Kids Fishing Derby. So it is for 80 kids will be able to participate in this. Um, so registration, um, Starts at 1, 1 to 1.45, with the fishing clinic kicking off from 2 to 4. Um, so I know you can't read this, I just wanted to make my point that we have invited a lot of groups to come be in the Conservation Village. Um, so it's 70 agencies and organizations and 18 Blue Star operators. I do realize that that weekend is DEMA. I've heard from a lot. You know, pick your weekend in the Keys and there's 10 things going on. Um, it was also the availability of the Islander. The, we actually went in trying to get the weekend after this, um, the, the 14th, um, and that weekend is booked for about the next five years. So, you know, and the weekend before was Halloween. So there's always something. So I know, I mean, I've heard from a lot of the dive people, Mary, I can't believe you picked this weekend. And, you know, you gotta pick one, and there's a conflict um, with something all the time. Um, but we did invite a lot. If you did not receive, so there were two emails that went out. One was an invitation for the dinner. The second one was an invitation um, to have a booth in our conservation village. Um, I'm sure we missed some group. If we did, if your nonprofit agents or agency did not get an invitation, um, please let me know, and we'll get you one um, if you would like to participate. But we uh, kind of did some brainstorming and tried to come up with uh, quite a few of them. Okay. Um, so just so you know where to go when you come is on Saturday the dinner will be over where we hold in the ballroom where we hold our SAC meeting sometimes and then the, uh, the Sunday celebration will be right down here on the beach they have a fishing pier for our fishing uh, clinic and also it should work out pretty nice okay. so we need help and this is how can you participate um, you can host an activity booth in the conservation village if your group hasn't got an invitation, let me know. Or turn in your, your form so I know who's coming, so I can go out and mark the sand as to where everybody's tent is going to be and all. Um, you can help at one of our booths. The sanctuary will be having a number of booths at it, so you can come help um, with ours. We do have all hands on deck for our staff, but um, we're being pretty ambitious on this project, so we do need some extra help um, even at our booths. Or you can help at the kids' fishing clinic. And you can say, well, I don't know anything about fishing or whatever. That's okay. We need somebody to help herd kids. Um, we need help at the registration table. Um, you know, if you're the not time right from casting and stuff. So we have a lot of opportunities and would love to have you all out there. We think it's going to be just really um, a fun afternoon out at the Islander. Um, as Sean said, they've been a great partner on this um, and working with us on this. So I have two easels with markers. I'm going to set them out, so at some point today, if you're interested in helping, put your name up there. Um, if you specifically, I want to help with fishing, then write, you know, fishing clinic behind it. Um, if you're open to um, whatever Mary comes up with you, um, you know, for you to do, um, you know, just put your name up there, but we'd love to have you all come out. Um, Corey asked, Mary, are you organizing this one? I am. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you know, after today, uh, you can get a hold of me, um, florida.keys at noah.gov, floridakeys at noah.gov, mary.tagarini at noah.gov. Um, all three of those come to me, um, and my phone number, and I'm in the QR Go office, um, it's on the website, you guys can find me. <coughs> We'd love to have you. Right. And just add also, if you do sign up, um, please include your t-shirt size uh, because uh, we're, we're going to have uh, very bright t-shirts so people know who the staff are or to ask questions and things like that. So um, we really do need the help and, and sincerely appreciate it. We just want to help volunteer and work with our folks on all those, on all those things. I think it's going to be a really good time. And, um, 
Uh, special thanks to Jack, uh, who helped, uh, helped us with the fishing rods and, and, and getting those from the, uh, from the first style rod fishing rods. Sure, I have a question. Are those the same orange t-shirts we have with the public? Yeah. <laughs> the yellow ones? Yeah. We've got, we're, we're getting better ones. We're getting better ones, Jack. Yeah. 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 They're newer, brighter, and more fun. <laughs> well, yeah, I really laughed about this, but they as were. a person who, when we had, those of you that were in Key West, we had, what, 250 people in that room, and I needed a staff person, and I could look, and I could see who a staff person was, and go, you've come, and that's, uh, we're going with another really bright color for on that Sunday, so that as we have a lot of people down there, and I need somebody, I can find that person in that really bright shirt. So, there's method to our madness. In, any questions? Excellent. All right. Well, like, like Mary said, she'll have those easels up there. Uh, her role model, yeah. Go ahead. All right. With that wrapped up, uh, the, the next item on the agenda is uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Superintendent Pedro Ramos. There's Pedro in the back here uh, down <laughs> at the National Park, and uh, and with him is Fred. Uh, yeah, Fred's here as well. Um, they're here to talk about um, their their management plan, their farm management plan that was just released at, uh, at, at the last meeting. We had the scheme uh, national park talking about theirs. I think uh, similar to the scheme, very very similar issues and, and challenges. Um, and uh, I think you know we invited uh, Pedro here. To, they were afraid to talk about some of the things that they're looking at, um, so what kind of what's going into their plan, and this is also to sort of feed you guys information about ideas as you make your deliberations uh, in the coming years about, about our management plan as well. So uh, I guess without any further ado, we need to introduce Superintendent Pedro Ramos and, and Fred Hurl, who's a chat plan. How are you? This is a this is a long room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just go down the road. I, 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 I expect to see members of my staff here. How are you, well, I'm Mr. Mr. Cossey? You are everywhere. How do you do it? There's three. Huh? There's three. Hey, how are you? All right. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you, see you too. too. Okay. Microphone and this. Microphone. Fred. Fred's gonna be in charge of Fred, the, Fred's the slides. Fred's huh? here. I'm okay. just gonna do a little <laughs> intro. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, it's good to see you, Sean and uh, Billy, and, and members of the uh, of the advisory uh, board. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is a faculty, right? <laughs> yes. So, well, so more. Yeah. All right. Same rules. All right. Uh, have a little experience working with uh, committees like this. Uh, uh, I'm Pedro Ramos. I'm the superintendent for Everglades and Dry Tortugas National Parks. You, you need to hold uh, I'm the I'm the not so new kid uh, on the block, and I say that because I've been down here in South Florida now for about 15 years. Uh, I spent most of that time at Big Cypress National Preserve, uh, serving as a superintendent and. Uh, uh, Fred reminded me today as we were driving down to the Keys, which, by the way, is way to leave Miami, <laughs> and, uh, and, and cross that line and drive into the Keys. Uh, it, it has some kind of effect on you <laughs> that, I, that I like. I need to think about moving down to the Keys and actually live down here. Uh, but as we were driving down, Fred was reminding me that uh, I got here nearly 15 years ago to South Florida. And uh, it's amazing how now I turn out to be the senior National Park Service a professional down here in South Florida. And I looked at Fred and I said, Fred, I know what you mean. That is code for you are now the old man. <laughs> a, it's been an incredible, a, incredible ride a, for me to have been here that long. A, Sean, thank you for the opportunity to spend time here with the council. A, You've invited us uh, here to, to speak about the general management plan for Everglades National Park. <coughs> it took us nearly 13 years to complete. It, it has a lot of moving parts in it. We're very proud of the outcomes of that plan. We released it last uh, August. I know that many people that are in this room gave us their input throughout the course of that entire process, and we appreciate it. Uh, that is why plans like this uh, are successful. 
uh, particularly when it comes to the implementation of them. And I'm really excited that, uh, and I feel privileged that after 13 years, I'm the guy that gets to show up last January, get appointed into the superintendency of Everglades National Park, and bring this thing through the finish line. And it would be really easy for me to start taking all the credit, but that's something that I would never do uh, because this really was an incredible, incredible uh, effort by our team and members of the community, uh, many of you uh, included, that were involved in getting us uh, through that finish line just, just recently. Uh, the plan has some very significant <coughs> components to it. Uh, it's about 600 pages long. I know Fred's been carrying the book around now for about uh, two weeks. I know he's got one by his bed. He's got several in his office. He leaves some in the bathroom. You wouldn't believe where Fred takes his books. <laughs> he takes them everywhere, and I'm sure that he has copies for you if you wanted some. Uh, but you know, some of the most important components of, of that plan involve things like it, what we're going to do in East Everglades, and that's the, the northeast part of, of the park, uh, near the corner of Miami there and the Tamiami Trail, all related to restoration and responsibilities that we have, uh, for instance, to acquire lands that are still in private ownership in that area so that we can benefit from all of that restoration of work that we've been doing now for years to bring the water south of, of the trail. And we've got a, we're already moving in that direction. We've got some really cool stuff that we're doing on the western part of the, of the park uh, related to uh, visitor experiences. And of course, uh, I think that one of the most important components of the plan is what we're doing down here in, uh, in, in Florida Bay, a uh, neighboring uh, to, to, the, to the sanctuary and, and the community of the Keys. Uh, Florida Bay is a very special place, as, as, as you all know. Uh, it's one of the reasons I keep telling people why the park many, many years ago was designated as a World Heritage Site, a place that is not only important to us as Floridians and as Americans, but also uh, to the rest of the world. It's the largest seagrass prairie in the world. And, and things are happening. Climate change uh, is really presenting challenges. It's becoming harder for us to forecast uh, weather and things like that. And, and, and we need to get accustomed to expecting the unexpected. And that kind of circumstance <coughs> uh, requires us to, to be thoughtful and to, to, to really uh, be smart about how we manage these special places. And uh, what we ended up having in Florida Bay as a final outcome uh, within our plan is something that I think it will help us make the bay more resilient. Uh, as, as many of you may know, the bay uh, has been suffering conditions that are not all that great. Uh, the salinity levels have been off the charts. Uh, the temperatures have been very hot. And uh, there's a, a good amount of seagrass that, that has been dying. Uh, some of those effects, uh, regardless of whether we uh, we let the faucet from the skies uh, open up uh, <coughs> today or, or tomorrow. Some of those effects will continue on for, for some time and, and we're mon monitoring and also frustrated because there's not much more than, that we can do other than continue doing things like pushing for Everglades restoration uh, so that we can bring more fresh water flows into the bay and manage the bay uh, and, and the, the visitor activity on the bay uh, in a wise way. And I, I, I really do think that uh, through all the civic engagement that, that, we, that we had uh, on this component of the plan, we ended up in a good place that will help us bring that resiliency that that bay uh, really deserves and, and needs. Fred Hurley, who is going to help us run through a PowerPoint describing uh, where we're at with the plan, has been at this now for a long time. I'm not going to say how many years, but Fred uh, is one of maybe three people on our staff that has been working on this project from the very beginning, the entire time, nearly 13 years. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for his leadership in this particular uh, project. And, 
I keep telling him, and because we finished the plan doesn't mean that we're done. Now is when the work begins uh, with the implementation of the plan, and, uh, and and we're already moving in that direction. So, Fred, why don't you come up and uh, take us over some of the main things that are happening with the plan? Do you want to have one? Sure. Okay. okay. So just hold it up a little bit. Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Is it on? Yep. yep. Back. Okay. Great. Well, thanks again for inviting us, Sean, and everybody else to uh, speak to the advisory council. Uh, we were here uh, about two, a little over two years ago when, when Dan Kimball was superintendent. So um, uh, I'm just going to pick up from where we left off uh, at that point. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what our draft plan came out in 2013 and what the um, Sanctuary Advisory Council made as a motion or recommendation to us as we move from draft to final plan. So I'll, I'll talk about that as kind of the, kind of the cornerstone of uh, just a, a very brief presentation this morning. Uh, I'll highlight a couple of the uh, key changes between the draft plan and the final plan and what, we, what we'll see today. And again, it's really just focused on primarily the floor and piece of the, uh, of the parks management plan. As Pedro said, you know, there's East Everglades and restoration flows into the park which are uh, taking up a lot of uh, important efforts as well with other stakeholders but obviously what happens north of here affects uh, the entire ecosystem not only the bay and the park but also the, the sanctuary and uh, all the other important uh, natural resources in and around this area uh, so i'll touch on that and i'll just briefly wrap up with you know kind of where we are today and then hopefully we'll have a good amount of time uh, for questions and discussion Okay, okay, so here we were uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, Dan and I came, and I think we met at uh, uh, just up the street here at, at, at Duck Key. And um, we had a, a presentation about what our preferred alternative was. And uh, at that point, we were about halfway through our, our nine public meetings. And I think what the sentiment was from, from the public and, and stakeholders was that for Florida Bay, they really liked the resource protection measures that we had identified uh, in our plan, but there was some concern about access and use of the bay and our marine waters uh, from what historically had been the case to what we were proposing, or at least what was reflected on the maps that were in our draft plan. So, uh, so some of the key uh, outcomes of that, uh, that meeting that we had uh, with the council was that a motion was passed, I think nearly unanimously, to investigate uh, with, with greater detail uh, stakeholder input and, um, and, and to better delineate the zones and how we would manage Florida Bay, including opportunities for additional channels and ways to navigate uh, across the bay and to key destinations in the park with, with a variety of, of, of corridors. Um, look at adaptive management to modify zones and how we would change over time, whether as sea level rose and, and, and depths increased or whether we just learned more about how the bay was being used and how we could better protect and provide for visitor enjoyment at the same time. Uh, the council would really recommended that we uh, focus on how to integrate that uh, voter education permit program that we talked about uh, as kind of a cornerstone for how the plan would be understood and implemented over time and um, also talked about uh, just like this body here the park felt it was really important to have a stakeholder group at the table with us, helping to understand and manage uh, the bay and the other marine waters of the park uh, in the years ahead. So those were four very important points that uh, this council recommended to us, and I, and I think we, I know we took it very seriously, and I think we did a pretty good job of, of being responsive to these, to these calls. And I'll talk about those uh, over the next few minutes. So when you asked us to go back, and many others asked us to go back and talk to stakeholders and look at the Bay uh, in greater detail, we did that. And we did that by not, not just sitting in rooms like this and talking to uh, fishermen or conservation organizations and, and their representatives, but we really uh, spent a lot of time on the water with people. We went out on boat trips with uh, fishing guys, conservation, uh, conservationists that cared about the birds uh, and the natural resources of, of, of the Bay and the park. Um, and we just really, and we met elected officials, and we really tried to find common ground. So we looked at uh, additional analysis and considerations that should be taken into account 
to figure out how do we make this, uh, this bay, how do we provide for better protection while providing for good use and enjoyment. So we looked at a, a variety of factors, uh, water depth to get across the, uh, across the bay, water depth to get to, to key destinations and where impacts were uh, clearly obvious. We looked at places where there were a number of uh, nearby channels that were taking pe people from basically point A to point B, or area A to area, to B, area B, and how can we consolidate uh, access. We looked at uh, areas of important resource concerns, be it for nesting birds on, on, key, uh, on keys or in uh, shallow water mudflats uh, within the bay. We thought a lot about unintended consequences. If we took an action, what were, not only do we uh, want to understand what we thought might happen, but we wanted to know what others thought might happen in the long term. And we tried to take that, that thinking into account and, and, and being flexible in how we made decisions and how we would pilot uh, certain aspects of the plan. And then we looked at uh, kind of the, the difference between destinations and transit. In other words, where do people want to get to as an important destination to um, see wildlife or, or go fishing or appreciate the, the quiet of the bay? versus those places that were more of a transit corridor going across from, say, the Keys up to Flamingo. So those are some of the, the, the factors that we consider in our analysis. Um, focusing in on the preferred alternative that's in the final plan, uh, some of the key strategies uh, that we, we developed and, and that are uh, within the next week will be approved as part of the record of decision for the environmental impact statement is that we would, number one, establish uh, as I talked about before, a mandatory voter education program. Uh, we, along with stakeholders, uh, some of which folks are in the room here, are helping us to define the messages and the objectives of that course, and it will focus on resource protection, safety, as well as uh, proper voter behavior, people on the water. How, do, how can you respectfully uh, acknowledge other people that are using the bay and, and take that into account? So we have a contract with an organization called the Equity Institute that does a lot of uh, voter, uh, not only voter, but uh, natural resource and, and wilderness education throughout the National Park Service and other uh, land management agencies, and we are we have an agreement with them to develop that course, and we expect to roll that out uh, in 2016. Uh, we have a series of zones that will better protect the shallow water areas of, of Florida Bay. Uh, all told, there's about 144,000 acres of, of of zoning that includes uh, what, what most people know of as is pole and troll zones, which will uh, be in areas of, of roughly less than two feet at mean low water that will not allow combustion engine use at all. Uh, there's about 100,000 acres of that. There's also about 26,000 acres of a new designation we've called, what we're calling a pole troll idle zone. And that was actually a stakeholder uh, developed idea where we, where we would, particularly in western Florida Bay, where, where tides are much more. Um, uh, very much greater uh, throughout the day. Uh, when, when water is deeper, we will allow, allow uh, uh, folks to idle through those areas. And you'll see a map of that in a moment. Uh, we also have some, some uh, paddle only backcountry zones, uh, and some special protection zones which are closed uh, for important natural resource purposes. And we've added a fair amount of idle and slow speed corridors. And you'll see those in a, in a moment as well, which kind of gets to that point of balancing resource protection uh, with, with, with uh, appropriate and reasonable access. Um, and then the last bullet, again, we will have an advisory committee established. Uh, it'll be some version of what uh, the, the group you have here, and they'll help us to understand how well we're meeting our goals, allow for adaptive management actions to take place over time. Again, this will be a 20 to 30 year plan, and it will allow us to modify our strategies uh, to reflect the, the real conditions that we're observing uh, over time. So here's a map of Florida Bay. I know there's a lot of colors and lines. Um, I'll just briefly, is there a pointer on this? Uh, or should I just walk up to the screen? Yes, the pointer does work. Okay, here we go. So just real quickly, I don't want to spend a lot of time, and I can quickly circle back with this if there are any questions, but uh, the, the pole control zones are outlined by this uh, kind of this gray blue line. So anything where you see the word pole control uh, outlined here, that's the about 102,000 acres of, of pole control zones. And clearly on, on, in the eastern and central Florida Bay, 
that, uh, they follow very closely the, the keys and the, and the shallow banks that, 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 that form these corridors coming off the intercoastal and across to the, the northern shoreline. So these are very much tied to the, to the keys and islands that, that uh, permeate throughout uh, eastern and, and, and central and western Florida Bay. Uh, in kind of the northwest portion here, coming out of, here's Flamingo, here's the snake bite pole and troll zone, just to orient folks to where we are, here's Flamingo. Uh, snake bite pole and troll zone, 10,000 acres, been in place since 2010. Um, so in this western portion here, uh, we have areas that are much larger in nature. Obviously, there's no, there's not a lot of keys out here, but, but these are uh, shallow water areas like Nine Mile uh, Bank. Um, and here's this, this pinkish color here. This is the, the pole troll idle areas that we talked about, about 26,000 acres that will allow for that flexibility when water comes up over two and a half, three feet, up to five, six feet and more, uh, folks will be able to you know, idle with their, with their combustion engine uh, through these areas. We looked at that as a viable alternative rather than putting on-plane uh, transit through, through these areas, which, because there are some deeper channels in here, but the trade-off of resource protection and maintaining the quality of these areas was to make it a pole troll idle as opposed to putting in running lanes that went across uh, these important banks. Um, and then you see a bunch of, of, of lines, both red, orange, uh, yellow, and pink. So red are the existing channels that the park currently marks. There's about 53 of them, and you can see them uh, throughout the bay. Um, the key issue that we, that we added between the draft and the final plan were uh, yellow lines, which are slow speed corridors, uh, which will take people across Nine Mile Bank as an example. Uh, idle speed uh, corridors, which go to key destinations. You see them up in, up in each of the bites, just like we did for Snake Bite, where we have uh, uh, an idle speed area in Jimmy's Lake here, uh, in Garfield and, and Rankin and, and the others, we're providing, uh, when water is deep enough, idle speed to get you up through much of these areas so that it enhances the opportunities to explore uh, these shallow water areas. Um, we also have some new on-plane uh, corridors, such as uh, these coming out of Flamingo, which basically take people, uh, it's deep enough that you, you can actually run on-plane through some of these areas. There's one over here by Coon Key in the middle of the bay that was important for, for people coming out of the Keys and getting across the bay. So we made some, uh, again, through on-the-water analysis, went out, measured depth, figured out where it was appropriate to protect the resources while providing access. And, and a lot of these locations are, are, fo are, are local knowledge areas, and, and we felt it was, it was the right balance of protection and access. So we're going to try it out, and uh, uh, again, this will all be documented as part of the voter education program. We're also working with Bonefish Tarpon Trust and the University of Alabama uh, Geography Department to develop a, a GPS and apps that will be tied to the voter education and, and people can download. So it'll be uh, you know, virtual documentation for, for people that are familiar with, with, with the park, as well as some limited on the water marking of, of these corridors uh, and areas I've, I've touched on. Uh, just lastly, before I go on to, to wrapping up the presentation, I want to uh, highlight uh, uh, the Crocodile Sanctuary, an area that's been closed uh, to the public since the 1980s. It's about 14,000 acres, and it goes from Little Madeira Bay to Joe Bay, Snag Bay, all the way over to the 18-mile uh, stretch. Um, in the draft plan, our preferred alternative had the entire area closed. Uh, based on comments uh, that we received from the public, we examined the scientific and natural resources, <coughs> resource values of this area and weighed it against uh, uh, some limited uh, opportunities for access. And the decision made in the final plan is that the Joe Bay, Snag Bay area will be open as a paddle only zone, about 4,000 uh, acres. It will be reopened for the first time since uh, the 1980s, uh, again for paddle only, and uh, catch and release fishing, which will be the only catch and release fishery uh, in the park. We're going to pilot that project as well. Uh, we're going to provide some more. Uh, about three or four mooring uh, balls or, or, or pilings uh, in Trout Lake just south of Joe Bay so people that are bringing their motorboats can tie up there and then take their, their canoes or kayaks and explore the Joe Bay area. So this map, uh, this slide rather shows um, uh, the, access, the access provisions in the draft plan over here versus the final plan here. So. Uh, what you'll notice here in the draft plan is that these yellow, orange, and red colors, 
that, that showed areas that were over uh, three quarters of a mile to uh, up to a mile and a half of distance that people would have had a polar troll from either an existing channel or the edge of a polar troll zone and, and, a, and a deeper water area zone. So by adding in, uh, in this map here, you know, those additional access points that I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, what that does is it, it really uh, diminishes uh, uh, the distance that people have to travel to uh, access the shallow waters area, areas of the park. So what you see is that in snake bite, which already exists, it's the only place where there's still an orange, red area, uh, which signifies areas over one mile in distance to polar troll. Um, all the rest of the, of the uh, orange and reds have disappeared. There's a few, few yellows and some of the deeper uh, uh, banks. Uh, in western Florida Bay, but other than that, the, the, the bay is far more accessible uh, with also very strong uh, resource protection measures. So I just want to wrap up with, by just highlighting some of the feedback that we received since the draft plan, since the final plan, excuse me, uh, was released on August 28th. And I'm just going to have two slides. One is a uh, excerpt from a letter from the uh, National Parks Conservation Association that really speaks to the uh, what they saw as a very, a very good plan for the entire park, including the bay and, and our marine waters, uh, relative to protection, uh, resilience to uh, the effects of climate change and, and sea level rise over time. And really, uh, the, the important thing, I think, was that uh, the public engagement and, and, the, and, the, and the efforts of folks like the, here in the room, as well as hundreds and thousands of other people weighing in and really uh, showing their, their, their connection to the park and the importance of protecting and enjoying it for, for, for current and future generations. And the willingness to work with the park to, to reach these goals, I think, was really, um, I think, the, the part to be most proud of in terms of the plan getting accomplished, and then a, a more importantly, as Pedro said, is what we're going to do with the plan and really move to an aggressive and strong implementation effort. So NPCA spoke to those, to those elements. And then the other one I wanted to just highlight was, was a letter that, that came in after the final plan came out, and it, it represents um, eight national and international uh, organizations, some of which don't normally uh, align themselves with NPCA. Uh, sometimes they do, of course, because they're all in the conservation business, but uh, for example, the National Marine Manufacturers Association was one of the groups, and the American Sport Fish Association, Sport Fishing Association was another. And they were groups we met with regularly and really tried to work out this balance of protection access and, and education to the public. So you know, they signed on as well, as well as the Guy Harvey Foundation, uh, IGFA, uh, Coastal Conservation Association, and others that really talked about uh, the approach that we all use together, the stakeholders and the Park Service, uh, how good public policy should be developed and really expressed uh, how they were pleased with the outcome of where we struck the balance of protecting the resources while providing for reasonable uh, boating and fishing access. So uh, we believe that th these words of all these various groups speak to the, you know, the collective effort that we all went through and, and worked hard on to, to come to this, this point in time in finalizing the plan. I just want to take one second to, uh, one moment to uh, talk about an area on the western co west coast of the park, also in the marine waters, from Everglades City to Flamingo. Uh, we've established a 120-mile alternative route to the existing wilderness waterway, which many of you may have uh, been on in one portion or another over the years. This will be an alternative, uh, what we're calling the Everglades Paddling Trail, 120 miles uh, from the Turner River headwaters, or the Turner River, where it leaves Big Cypress along Tamiami Trail. And it takes uh, sometimes parallel, but often separate, less traveled routes that takes people all the way down, whether you're traveling from north to south or south to north. There's a variety of opportunities that uh, will highlight uh, a more wilderness type experience for paddlers uh, and, and motorboaters to some extent. There are certain segments that uh, during the peak November through April season will be designated as no motor or slow speed segments to improve the backcountry recreation experience, but it will largely be kind of a, a less traveled route that people could take if they wanted to experience uh, that portion of the park, um, whether they're coming from Florida Bay or from the north end. Uh, and it will tie in the natural and cultural resource histories uh, of the park, uh, we think, in a, in, a, in a real exciting and in a new way. Um, so where are we now? We, as I mentioned earlier, August 28th, we released the final plan. Uh, we expect in the within the next week or so to have uh, Regional Director Stan Austin 
uh, in our Atlanta regional office to uh, sign and approve the record of decision, uh, which basically completes the, the planning process, uh, finalizes the environmental impact statement, and allows us to begin implementation uh, in 2016 and beyond. Uh, one of the key pieces will be uh, getting that voter education program in place in 2016. The revenue from that program will help us uh, hire additional law enforcement rangers. It will allow us to better mark the, the, channel, excuse me, the channels and the travel corridors that were identified in the map and will actually allow us to do some active uh, seagrass and, and benthic resource uh, protection and restoration over time as well. So with that, I'm going to, uh, again, thank you for your time. And uh, Pedro, if you want to wrap up or go on to questions and discussion. Uh, thank you, Fred. I think uh, that covered a lot of ground. As I said earlier, a lot of moving parts to, to this planning effort and, and the outcomes of it. Uh, we're going to have to prioritize uh, very carefully. I shared with you that uh, we're already putting a lot of uh, effort and attention into the acquisition of lands in East Everglades, the northern part of the, of the park, uh, that we need to acquire so that we can allow that flow of water that we want into the park uh, without restriction uh, once all of the components of, of restoration are in place for us to, to make that happen, which is, which is coming pretty soon. Uh, this restoration business has been going on for a long, long time, and I feel sorry for the folks that were sitting in a room 20, 30 years ago thinking about all this stuff and not seeing anything happen. But those were the dreamers. Those were the folks with the vision. And now there's people like us actually seeing things happen and making them happen and turning faucets on. And it's exciting. And that up there is a priority. A Florida Bay is clearly a priority. And so us a whole bunch of other components of this plan. Fred did not mention Flamingo. We want to make something out of Flamingo. There's only one Flamingo in our country, in South Florida, southern tip of the peninsula, what a special place. And when you visit Flamingo nowadays, it doesn't really feel like we have, we have done what we should have been doing with it throughout the years. It doesn't, doesn't look well maintained, doesn't feel a, like the type of place that you visit when you uh, perhaps get on a plane and go out west and visit the Grand Canyon or, or Yosemite. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that that we're going to to try to build a Disneyland uh, out of Flamingo, but we need to do something more appropriate than what we've got in Flamingo right now, so that we can all be proud of of that place, and so that we can attract. <coughs> Uh, visitors, particularly visitors that have not been coming out to the parks, we've got an issue of relevance in the national park system. And I suspect that the sanctuaries are also dealing with some of this dilemma where the demographics of our country are changing and we haven't really kept up with our responsibilities to make sure that, that, that we welcome people in the way that they need to feel welcome. And now these folks expect a certain level of service when they go someplace, and, and Flamingo, I'll, I'll get out Flamingo, but Flamingo is one of those places that that we need to invest some time and attention and, and emphasis and priority into. Uh, these plans don't come with any money, and that's something that uh, members of the public uh, oftentimes uh, forget. It takes us 13 years, and then we have to prioritize and find money. And for, for the primary components of this plan, I know that money will, will come a little easier. And uh, things like Florida Bay, you know, we're already on it. And I mentioned earlier, we're extremely concerned about the conditions that we're seeing in the Bay. And while well, there's not much that we can do short term, there are things that we have to be doing a longer term, looking down the road and making sure that we do what we have to do as stewards of, of the Bay to make it resilient to whatever happens. You know, we can't forecast what climate is gonna bring to us uh, in years ahead, but we sure uh, know what actions we can take to make the Bay more resilient so that it can adapt uh, a lot better than it would otherwise. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's where we're gonna put our money into, and that's where we're gonna put our science <coughs> into, and that's why uh, this outcome for Florida Bay uh, 
seems convoluted to some people and complicated. I've gone on the road a little bit on this, not as much as Fred, uh, but you know, I've, I've gone on a plane, I've gone to DC on this topic a few times, and you put a, a map uh, like the ones that you saw uh, at people in DC, and you know, it's, it's just too complicated. You guys probably not so complicated because you're very familiar with Florida Bay. But you know, the point is that these are different times and they require different thinking. And I think that that's what we've accomplished through this plan, particularly when it comes to Florida Bay. I know that not everybody is going to love it. As I tell people, I believe that the outcome of this plan it gave, uh, it did not give anybody everything, but it gave everybody a lot. And, you know, that's a good place to have the needle and work from there. Nothing is set in stone. This is going to be a learning process. Implementation, uh, you know, is something that we're already engaged in. And one of the things, and my last comment, is that I really uh, commend you guys uh, in the sanctuary, Sean and Billy, that a, for your leadership in having a group like this and, and for the members a, for your participation. I know that you don't get paid to sit around this table. A, you guys do it because you care. A, that's the same a, experience that I had at the Cypress National Preserve with our a, FACA committee. A, and we are committed a, to building a committee that will help Everglades National Park with these Florida Bay issues. Florida Bay, a, advisory committee, I think is what you call it. And that's one of those implementation efforts that, that we're going to be putting emphasis on early on. So with that, I'll shut up and <laughs> take any questions that, that uh, you'd like to ask. Billy's got the mic. Uh, Fred, you're going to have to help me more, so <laughs> make sure you have a mic too. Yeah. Yes. Just uh, Pedro and Fred, thank you very much. I was really clear. Uh, I'm so excited for what you're doing. I'm really pleased that you're using marine zone, you're the zoning and the, the pole and troll area, and I think that's going to really help resolve a lot of the issues that you've been dealing with. But what I wanted to say, back, back to this committee, uh, for your information, I want to make sure it's clear. The very first advisory council that was formed in 1992, actually started in 91, was required un under FACA, it was covered under FACA. But in our reauthorization of our National Sanctuary uh, Act, um, we are uh, exempt from following FACA per verbatim, but we still follow the procedures for each of the advisory councils that are formed. So we, it's a little easier for us to put together advisory councils than strictly following FACA. It took us over a year to seek the first advisory council using the FACA process because of the the step and had to be signed off on by the White House at that time. Yeah, that's the way we still have to do it in the service and it takes a lot of effort as, as you know, you, you've done it, this is how you started this committee, it's good to know that that you're not covered by it anymore. Maybe, maybe look into some 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 way to get uh, some sort of exemption because we got it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, thanks. The last, the last thing um, I, I want to say is um, what we're seeing this year, uh, I mentioned this to Ken a while ago, I think it's good. I want to get, I'm getting to a question here about SEP. But, um, about what? SEP mm -hmm. and, um, and, and modified water delivery and so on. But what we're seeing this year in Florida Bay is a repeat of exactly what happened, almost exactly what happened in 1987. And that is at a time when we were having bleaching on the outer reefs. In 87, it was a massive bleaching on the entire outer reef track throughout the Keys and turned out to be a Caribbean wide massive bleaching event. At the same time, the seagrasses started dying in Florida Bay in 87. Jay Zeman was doing his work out there. And, and at the time, we didn't immediately link the two, but then later on we did to elevated sea surface temperatures, Florida Bay being a hot bathtub, um, slick calm, everything demanding oxygen at night. It just, it was the, 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 the makings of, of an environmental collapse. And that's, I think we've seen more of that this year. We're seeing seagrass die off, but I think a lot of it has been tempered a little bit by the fact that we've had some mixing going on. What we looked at at that time, and it was this advisory council at their very first meeting in February of 1992, 
that George Barley, Allison DeFore, Mike Collins, Allison Fair, Sandy Sprunt, a whole group said, we need to go look at Florida Bay. We need to deal with Florida Bay problems. And it started getting to getting the right delivery of water into the bay. And, and how far away are we from that? I mean, what, what are we, I know, I know this is a loaded question. But there's a number of projects that are going to help. That you talked about that eastern side of the park and, and the Kamiami Trail on down through the slough. Um, how many more projects are we looking at? A lot, yeah. a lot. A, you know the, the I'm glad that you're asking the question, Billy. And I, I've been at this now for some time. Uh, you know that. Uh, this is this is an environment that I've been I've been living in now for nearly 15 years, it, and as you see people come and go, particularly folks that come down and work for our agencies, whether the National Park Service or Sunlight Service or some of the other agencies involved, they come and go, and some of the fundamental things uh, are oftentimes forgotten. And one of the things that I've noticed that is oftentimes uh, forgotten is that. The, one of the main reasons why we got into Everglades restoration wasn't just to hydrate the wetlands in the northern part of the system or even in the park. It's because we needed to get water down to Florida Bay. Florida Bay is the ultimate benefactor of all of this work. I've been talking to people uh, over the past months about what's happening in Florida Bay, and, you know how it relates to restoration and. Another thing that I that I want to I want to put out that comes to mind when when I think about your question is the fact that even if we had full restoration freshwater flows into the bay, we believe that what's happening in Florida Bay this summer will still be happening to some degree. Yeah. We don't know to what degree, but to some degree, we we have rainfall that started very late in the year. It just hasn't been enough. Uh, weather, you know, climate changing is more difficult to forecast. So uh, it, it highlights the importance of making the bay more resilient. But let's make sure that we don't uh, get into our heads or believe that somehow restoration of those freshwater flows that we're going to get back into the bay are going to make it bulletproof to, to what's happening. It, 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 What's happening highlights a lot of things, and, and that's one of them. Uh, SEP and, and, and SERP, uh, as I said, things are, things are well underway. We're finally seeing uh, projects. We, we have a one-mile bridge that's there, and I love driving over it every time that I go to the West Coast, and I stop, and I look, and, and, and it's just amazing to think where we were even five, you know, ten years ago, where we're at today. We're looking to breaking ground on uh, the next phase of the Tamiami Trail Bridging, uh, which is a 2.6 mile bridge, uh, as early as in April of next year. And it's going to take, you know, maybe a year and a half, two years to, to, to complete. Uh, nowadays, when you put out bids, you don't know what you're going to get back. Well, when we put out the bid on, on the bridge, it's a partnership with the Florida Department of Transportation. We got 20 bids for that project. That's, that's awesome. And, we're deep into the process now towards towards uh, awarding that, that contract so that we can break ground and get going and build that bridge. There's also, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the moving parts on the eastern fringe of the park that need to be in place uh, for flood control, but also to keep water in the park. C111 and you know pump stations uh, closer to the to the trail. That's all underway. Things things are happening <coughs> at the same time as we are starting to open the the faucet, as I as I call it. Uh, this is all about plumbing, right? And uh, the incremental field testing actually uh, began. We were supposed to start it. I think it was. I've been hearing about it since I got here in, in January. A ton of excitement about getting the incremental field testing uh, going in. Every month I ask, where are we at? Where are we at with it? Well, eventually they told me we were going to start this summer. And it took, I think, about two months after we had the green light from all the permitting and all the 
bureaucratic steps that we needed to be taken care of for us to actually turn the pumps on, for the core to actually turn the pumps on, just because there wasn't any water to move. Uh, so it's just been one of those years, but things are happening. There's a lot that that uh, still remains to be completed, really a, a ton of projects. There's a long list of them. Uh, and last night, in fact, I, I looked at the schedule and I was looking at one for one thing in particular, and that is the the degradation of that levee that runs just north of the Tamiami Trail. I, mean, I always have that in mind because when you bring that levee down, that's that's when you're really going to see some some significant flows. And that's not happening for another 15 years, possibly. And, and set is not even authorized. We're hopeful that they will be built next year and, and that, that set will be authorized. But it's not even authorized, even though it's well planned and we know what we want to do. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I've been speaking with a lot of folks, uh, a lot of uh, frustration, and there's a lot of uh, people are impatient. Uh, I'm impatient also, but we need to stay or keep our eyes on the ball. And, and those balls are in motion. Uh, we've, we've designed good projects, uh, many of them funded. We just need to put them on the ground and, and accelerate them if, if, we, if we possibly can. Yeah. Peter? Did you have a mic over here for Bob? Do you want to ask questions? <coughs> Did you have, oh, sorry, Bob. You're, you're next. <coughs> um, uh, first, let me say this group can certainly appreciate a tremendous amount of work that you put in, into this project. I, uh, I was gratified to see your plans for expanding enforcement uh, capability to implement this. My question is, uh, can you share uh, your plans or, or hopes as far as how you're going to deliver the voter education program as far as accessing the audience and getting that well thought out uh, plan delivered? I'm going to have Fred help me with that question. <clears throat> But what I will tell you is that we've been developing uh, the, the actual education uh, program now for some time. The Epley Institute has been involved in the, the really solid uh, organization that has uh, done this before. Uh, I've seen some of, the, some of the product that is being developed and uh, it looks really, really, really good. And uh, Fred will, will give us more details on that. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. Again, yeah, this is a voter education course. I think is uh, if not unanimous. It had great consensus among all the public stakeholder groups, organizations. Felt this was something that without this, uh, nothing else would really work. So we are really uh, focused on uh, getting this up and running as soon as possible. Pedro mentioned we have been working on it. Uh, in the early stages because we were able to uh, secure a grant from an organization uh, of some stakeholder groups called the Florida Bay Stewardship Committee that works uh, on behalf of uh, Protection of Florida Bay. So um, the goal of the course is that um, it's going to be widely available, basically online, it's going to be the primary way to deliver. Whether you're sitting here in a hotel, at home, on the other side of the globe, and you're planning a trip to Florida in six months, or what have you, it's going to be uh, a web-based course that you can take on a computer, take on your, your tablet, on your phone if you happen to be you know, coming to the park and realize, oh, I, just, I want to rent a boat, I want to take this course. You can set up shop at Flamingo, take the course, and it's roughly going to be a 45 to one hour course, one, 45 minutes to one hour course. So clearly it's not meant, it has no intention to be a substitute for knowledge, experience, incrementally learning the bay or learning how to navigate the shallow water, but we think it will raise the bar of awareness of the importance and the navigation skills required for somebody to uh, uh, use the park and, and, and do it in a way that protects the resources, respects other voters, uh, makes for enjoyable time for themselves, doesn't damage the resources, doesn't damage their boats. 
So it's going to be, you know, again, widely available primarily, <coughs> online, you know, electronically delivered. We'll also have, we'll talk to, you know, facilities um, in the Keys and elsewhere. Um, if they can set up a, a kiosk or um, uh, the, the park at Flamingo, we'll set up, if, 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 let's say the uh, our internet goes down at Flamingo, which happens on occasion, we would have a hard copy or have it on a, a computer that uh, has it already downloaded so there'll be ways for people that are visiting the park to want to take a boat out um, to take the course. But we hope 99% of it will be based online. And if anybody has a chance and wants to, you know, Google Epley, E-P-P-L-E-Y, -E -E Institute, uh, they're based out of Indiana University. Uh, they do excellent courses in resource protection and, <coughs> and visitor use issues in national parks and other protected areas in the U.S. and I think even internationally. They've been a great partner and uh, we'll be beta testing the course probably in early 2016. And I know there's a few folks in the room here that have been involved a little bit in helping us develop course content, but um, if there's other folks, Sean, that uh, might want to be, inter be interested in helping us out and kind of testing it out, whether it's, you know, what's good, what's bad, what can be improved, uh, we'd be happy to um, take, take those, their contact info and perhaps share it with you and others to uh, when that uh, review period comes on, on board in early 2016. And then later in the year, we would actually launch the course for, for public use uh, in, a wide, in a widespread way. Uh, how do you guys motivate people to take these courses? Is it on your web? In other words, how do you get them to start? Right. Well, it's going to be, uh, obviously, it's not going to all happen overnight. It's going to quit, but it's, it's going to be mandatory. So it's going to be required. It's not voluntary. Well, that answers that question. Yeah, but, but That's still, always a good way to encourage, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it helps, it helps. But certainly the, uh, the communication piece of how are we going to you know, market it and make people aware of it, you know, whether they're visiting uh, from anywhere in the U.S. Or, or beyond or they live down here. You know, we, we have a, a marketing strategy, a, a public awareness strategy that we're going to roll out as well. You know, prior to the course being, let's say, June, June 1st is the, the kickoff date. You know, in the spring, we'll have a variety of ways to get the message out to people to make them aware of this is upcoming um, and get ready for it. So it will be an education mode as opposed to enforcement mode in the initial months. So it will be a kind of a hard, uh, rigorously you know, uh, penalized system if you don't have your, your, uh, your permit on, on day one. We want, to, we, want to, we want people to take the course, learn, give us feedback, and then over time it will be enforced when we expect uh, either greater participation. But uh, we'll start off with a kind of an education mode uh, rollout, and then over time, again, use the funds that we collect through the permitting process to uh, you know, manage the pole control zones, mark the corridors, uh, do seagrass restoration, uh, as well as hire uh, law enforcement to support education and protection on the water. Thank you. I, I have a question. Uh, Next. Oh, I just have a quick follow-up, but go ahead. Um, Let's get Peter is next, and then we'll Sorry. <laughs> you might ask my question. <laughs> yeah. But first, guys, I just want to say congratulations on the very near conclusion of the plan. So, you know, I, I view this as a remarkable success story. And really one of the greatest success stories in the Everglades decades. Really, you guys did a wonderful job, and I can't wait for it to start getting implemented. But Thank you. When this, you're welcome. When this process first started, it seemed like there was a, a general negative public attitude for what you guys were trying to do with the marine zoning. And you had um, public outcry, public dissent. You know, you had the screaming fishermen at the meetings. Um, these are very similar things to what you know we're viewing here with what the sanctuary is trying to do. But over the years, maybe it took 10 years, but my impression and opinion is that there really was a transformation, like really a turnaround of that opinion changing more towards positive attitudes. And these ideals and uh, antagonistic comments of, of mainly the fishing community really moved towards agreement, cohesion, and by the end, uh, like those comments, your, your final comments there, like that was opposite of what those people were saying in the beginning. So really an amazing transformation. And um, I'm wondering if you agree with that. That was my opinion. Uh, and if you do, you know, what do you attribute that to? Like, 
how did you get to that stage? Let me let me say a few things, and Fred's, Fred was here, and I want him to also uh, address your question, but you know, I will say that as an agency, years ago, we used to be very <coughs> independent in terms, of, <laughs> in terms of how we approached our management responsibilities over these places. And I'm not just talking about Everglades National Park. I'm talking about all of the national park units throughout the country. And, you know, over a decade ago, uh, we realized that taking that approach just wasn't going to work for us. And, you know, there's a reason why we were taking that approach. And uh, part of that reason is the history from which we come from. We used to be ran by the military in the early days. These places were patrolled by, by military people. And, you know, the agency was also seen for many years as almost a quasi-military organization. So, you have to understand the history there and why we were doing things in a certain way. But we realized and we've left behind a, that approach because we know that that working with the communities around us, not just in Everglades National Park, but throughout the country, yields results that people can really own and feel strongly about and defend and stand up for and help us implement and 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 you know folks they understand the values of these places besides just the natural values also. Uh, for many communities, uh, these places present an incredible economic uh, influx of, of, of opportunity. And so, you know, Everglades National Park and this planning effort of 13 years is an example of us taking that approach. And I think that uh, while it took us longer than perhaps it could have in completing the plan, uh, and you know, I, I've been down here for a while, and even though I wasn't at Everglades, I was at Big Cypress, and then Kimball and I were superintendents uh, that were good neighbors to each other. We were actually friends, and we would speak about this stuff. And we always spoke with each other also about what was happening in Big Cypress, which has been controversial for years. I was in court for half the time that I was there because we were making some really hard decisions and trying to balance that needle. Uh, you know, we always said to each other, it is not getting it through the finish line, it is about doing it right. And in this case, uh, we as an agency used a lot of discipline to slow things down and and to, to spend time developing that kind of interaction and relationship with the community that, that really, in many, in many instances, knew more than we did about this place that we are responsible for. And we took that approach, and we took our time, and, and we listened, and we were willing to not just listen, but go back to the drawing board and, 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 and redraft and rewrite and, and, and take input seriously and represent it in the work that we were doing. And that, that cost an incredible amount of delay. It cost an incredible amount of extra money that we didn't have that we had to go back to the agency to look for to, to keep the, the, the effort moving forward. But it resulted in, in, a, in a plan that, that I think, it, while not everybody's jumping up and down saying, yes, you did everything right, we, we, we have an extraordinary amount of support uh, to really move forward and implement it in a way that will be significant not only to the resource but also to the visitors. So, you know, it was about taking that time. And <coughs> the last thing that I will say is that no matter, no matter what it is that we're talking about as an agency, I always tell my folks that it is not about the goal that we're after. It is about the people aspect of the work that we do. You know, what, what's driving people, people that are involved, what's, what, what's really happening there? And when you pay attention to that, which is what these guys did, everything else kind of falls in place. And I think that that's, this is an example of that. Just to add what Pedro said, I agree with everything what you said. That was uh, exactly the key, uh, I think, that got us to the finish line and, and, the, and the process was was key. So, but I think what, kind of a cornerstone for us 
we heard a lot of the, the criticism that you had mentioned, Pete. Uh, back in 2007, 2008, when we kind of took that step back, we did uh, some science work on what's going on in the bay relative to the seagrasses and the health of the, the submerged resources of the, of the bay. We did uh, we completed a really strong visitor use analysis and trend uh, study with the University of Miami to really document kind of, you know, to kind of couple the natural resources that are being affected by what's going on demographically and by, by impacts of this escalating level of use that was uh, trending upward and showed no end in sight except for a little blip when the 2008-09 recession kicked in, which kind of turned things down and gas prices started going up, you know, use dropped. But other than that, I mean, the trend is, is, is basically going, you know, ever-increasing use, growing in activity. So that's why education is so important, because people are continuing to move into Florida, didn't want to go out of the water. So I think the science piece was important. And then once we uh, communicated that, and again, we didn't do it, and we did it in a shared way. We did it with, with stakeholders, and, and they helped us develop the scope of those, those projects, and they helped to uh, help us shape the, the final product so that it was actually understandable. And I think that's began to build trust uh, among the various parties. Uh, I think what Pedro said is also true in the fact that you know, folks in this room and, 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 and thousands of elsewhere know the park, know the resources better than we do most, most, most of the time. And we take the time to just understand that, acknowledge that, and incorporate that into our decisions and also into the notion of flexibility and adaptive management over time. Saying these are not lines on the map etched in stone, but these are things that we're going to start with and learn from and uh, refine over time. I think uh, really helped uh, everybody get on the same page. So while not unanimous, I think the results over overwhelmingly strong support here. I think the East Everglades piece actually got more controversial and more more challenging and pushed back to us um, in the last few months after the plan was released, as opposed to Florida Bay and. and Years prior, this area had by far the most contention and challenge to, to, to re reaching the finish line. So uh, you, you never know what's going to happen, but I think the fundamentals that Pedro laid out, coupled with doing the science and getting the data, uh, I think really helped all of us um, collectively uh, understand where we were and what we we're trying to achieve. Well, did you have a comment from my dad earlier? Yeah, I just uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, you had mentioned quickly about uh, GPS maps. Uh, I just think that the plan for Florida Bay, being a fishing guide, it's really progressive, really exciting. Uh, and I just wanted to know what you guys had in mind in terms of getting it out to the public uh, and interfacing with GPS. Right. Well, it's, it's, um, it's not as far along as the motor education course content itself, but um, as I mentioned, um, fortunately, the uh, Boat Fish Public Trust, which is one of the key organizations helping um, kind of work the plan, work with stakeholders and work with us in recent years, uh, has funded a, 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 a grant or a contract with the University of Alabama Geography Department. And they've worked, with, the folks there have worked all over the world in developing technologies for um, land and water-based uh, mapping that's, that's interactive. So the goal is in the near term, uh, the next number of months to develop, basically, you know, field tests, field truth, the lines on the map, validate them, and then develop a product that you know, the gardens and avionics and all those companies will be able to uh, incorporate into uh, their databases so that you know, customers of theirs can upload those. Um, uh, and there, you know, there might be other apps and other technologies that I'm not really up to speed on or familiar with that, that we want to make it get as widely available as possible. So we'll be having conversations with, with BTT and others and perhaps there's folks in the room here with a knowledge and experience that may want to uh, share and help us kind of figure this out. Because, you know, we know that the Great Barrier Reef and other places have developed you know, really good technologies to, uh, to map uh, marine areas, but um, uh, we are interested in kind of learning. I mean, technology is ever changing, you know, right, day by day, right? So we want to basically have a state-of-the-art uh, effort in place and then be able to you know, modify that and expand its its uh, availability to the public uh, to the greatest extent possible. But the idea would be you take the education course, you get your permit, and then you have the ability to then um, tap into these various tools and products 
you know, be it an electronic chart or you know, a new chart that on paper that the you know, company sell that you would have with you and, and learn from. Um, and uh, again, we're looking to make it as widely available, but there are talks with those organizations and the various uh, GPS companies to uh, make it available to their customers. I, I think that that is probably, if not more important than, than the education program itself. It is a, it is a complicated place to get, to get through. And you know, you go out with local people and they'll look at others and say, how in the world could you get lost in a place like this? And then other people come from elsewhere and they look at you and say, how in the world can you get around this place? How, 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 how did you learn how to run over? And without that kind of, uh, of tool, uh, something as complex as what you saw on the board, uh, we're going to have a tough time uh, enforcing it. I just want to, one more thing I want to mention. Um, well, one of the first messages we have in our course is, you know, and you all know this, kind of the know before you go approach and, and be and learn in increments. So while there might be a GPS product or, or a chart that says, well, here's where the zones are, here's where you can go, and here's where you can't go, you know, with a, with a combustion engine, we want to, you know, we don't want people navigating on, on the water looking at the GPS either. I mean, they need, it needs to be a, a tool that supplements knowledge that they've learned over time and ways that they've experienced it in real time because well, we don't want people staring at their, their console and not looking at what's going on in front of them or on their side. So it's kind of a trick because you, you want to have good products but you don't want people to be too comfortable and I'm preaching to the choir here, you don't want to be too comfortable with technology that gives you a sense that you're, you, you know more than you really do. So it's kind of that fine balance that we're looking for and uh, really stressing that um, you need to be well educated even if you have a GPS chip in terms of where you're going or where you shouldn't go until you know more. That's a great question. I think uh, Bruce had it in the day. Uh, uh, fairly yeah, and straightforward uh, follow-up question on that subject and then a, a bigger question about the kind of restoration water flows. So you described a permit and uh, a fee. What, how long will the permit last and what is the fee going to be? <coughs> Well, here, here's, uh, as you may have seen or heard about, uh, October 1st, the park, for the first time, I think since 1997, and again, this is going on across national parks all over the country, is uh, we were given the ability to uh, raise fees to better support our operations and our facility and management responsibilities. So uh, a number of fees have gone, went up October 1st for entrance into the main gate and various other fees that will be uh, some of them are, are going up um, uh, to a certain amount that will be in place in 2016. Others will be phased in over I think, a couple of fiscal year period. Uh, the concept of the voter education program, obviously since it's not on board yet, is that uh, we, there would be an introductory period, perhaps um, six months, where people taking the course uh, and then getting their permit, it would be free for the first year as a way of enticing people to uh, take the course, learn, become better stewards. Um, after that, so there's two parts. So one, the course will be for, the course will be free. Anybody can take the course, whether they visit the park, want to go to the park or not. We want to maximize education. If you plan to come into the park, that's where you will need to purchase your permit. The permit, again, I think for a six month period, we talked about making it free for the first year. After that, it would be, uh, I think, fifty dollars a year. Um, perhaps going up as high as 70 or 75 in, in year two or three. Um, but one of the things we don't know about the, the cost of it is we don't know how many uh, people will actually take the course and pay for the permit. We've estimated uh, based on visitor use statistics of boats, but we know some people go to the park once a year in their boat, some people go 200 days a year. So we have some kind of a range of, of estimates. So. Uh, we may adjust the price a little bit, but it'll probably be somewhere, it'll probably wind up roughly in the 50 to $75 range annually. Uh, and again, over time, we may learn that certain people don't need to take a course every year, they may be a two or three year cycle. Whereas new information uh, becomes available, people will have to take that module. So that's kind of what we're thinking of at the moment. But it could be changed as we learn more. If other people have questions on that subject, I can wait for my other one.
Mine's on that side. Yeah. A, a follow-up. A follow-up uh, to that. Is there a minimum age for the permit? Uh, we don't have a minimum age. We would, we would basically go along with the, with the state of Florida requirements for you know, having a required uh, you know, uh, youth at a certain age limit where if you're born a certain year, you're required to take certain uh, certain voter safety course through the state of Florida. We would basically go along with that and not, not say that you have to be you know, 16 or 18 years old or 14 years old. So it's basically the, you're going along with what the state of Florida requires for for, for younger people to uh, be able to vote in the state, and then if, if you meet that requirement, then uh, taking the park specific course would be open to, to that person. And and have you considered um, either waiving or at least reducing the permit fee for minors? Uh, I wasn't involved with the, with, the, with, the, with the fee structure per se. I think it's all. I think there's a little bit of flexibility there, Pedro. Well, the other part I wanted to mention is actually, a, that's the annual fee that I talked about. There's actually a, a, a much a lower price if you're coming for a week or two to visit. Just like if you drive into the park and you're coming for a vacation for a week, uh, your fee is reduced for your vehicles. It would be a reduced fee for kind of a short-term uh, boating permit. But uh, thoughts about uh, young people having a reduced fee, I'm not sure if that came up when we, we had our public meetings last year, but it's something that uh, uh, we have time to consider and, and fine tune. Well, I would encourage you, especially for residents, you know, you've got all of these kids that live all up and down the Keys that, that uh, you know, 50 dollars $75 is a lot for, you know, 15, 16 year old kid to pony up, you know, and yet potentially they can become the best stewards the Bay could ever have if you can get them involved, as opposed to chasing them away. And that fee structure may actually chase them to jet skis off on the ocean side instead of angling out in the bank. So just a consideration. Thank you, note of it. Excellent point, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So um, this is a, a deja vu question. I think I asked it of Dan the last time he was here. Um, back to the subject of water flows, water delivery, Everglades restoration. There's a, a pervasive rumor uh, or, uh -oh. or perception <laughs> that, that there's water available, and I'm not talking necessarily about the, uh, I'm not necessarily talking about this recent droughty summer, but that there's water available and that the park won't let it into the park because it's not clean enough to meet the, uh, the consent decree that law. That is absolutely not true. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Because I, I, it keeps coming that, back like a bat. Yeah, you know that uh, I, I've heard about that a lot. Uh, actually, not a lot, but I've heard about that some. And I've been, uh, as, as conditions in the Bay have deteriorated over the summer and into the fall, uh, I've been concerned that people may, may start uh, taking advantage of what's happening in the Bay to, to, to speak about specific concerns uh, or, or move certain agendas that they may have. Uh, so I've thought about this and, and I've, I've spoken with our scientists and colleagues in other agencies and they quite a bit about it. And the fact of the matter is that there has there has not been one drop of water held north of the Tamiami Trail because of the water quality issues, which is where this question really comes from. Uh, is that 10 parts per billion holding water from coming into the park? Are there ways and should everybody think about relaxing those those rules, which is not really a rule, it's a, it's a consent decree, it's a, the outcome of a case in court. Where the state has to uh, comply with that kind of uh, water quality uh, by the time it comes in, into the park. Uh, so, again, water is not being held north of the Tamiami Trail and then kept from coming into the park because of that water quality issue. In fact, the water quality issue is one that we're very happy with. Uh, 
the trending over the past three, four, five years has been great. Our scientists are pleased with it, and we see that trend continuing as we continue to uh, implement Everglades restoration throughout the entire system. Somebody asked me yesterday, so which is the most important project uh, out there? And I said, that's like asking me which one of my three kids I love more, you know? <laughs> You're not gonna get an answer out of that because you love them all the same. And each one of those projects uh, is important to, to get the water right in terms of quality and the volume and, and all the factors that need to be in place so that it can come into the park. What's keeping water from coming into the park is the fact that we don't have fully implemented projects, particularly on the eastern fringe of the park, that are designed and will be constructed to keep water that supposed to be in the park in the park and water from flooding at higher levels than the regular flooding that those adjacent lands east of the park have seen over time, so flood protection and, and pumping back into the park. Until we have, we can do incremental testing and we can bring some flows into the park and that's happening. Uh, and I shared with you earlier that we, we've, been, we've been waiting, we just didn't have enough water to do it, even, even if we wanted to. Uh, it was delayed for a couple of months. So we need to focus on the projects that are that are on that list of projects to serve and, and hopefully get set approved. And if we continue focusing on that, everything else will fall in place. Water quality continue, will continue to get better. We will get to where we need it to be. And water will be able to be uh, to flow into the park uh, at, a, at the volumes that we would like it to be not only at the volumes that we would like it to be, but also at the distribution, which is equally important as the volumes, not just the quantity, but where we put it there so that it hydrates that whole system and ultimately makes it out to Florida Bay okay, so that the salinity levels that we're seeing can be mitigated to some degree, even at times when Mother Nature throws us a curveball like the one that we got this year. Thanks. That answer. Very much, thank you. Thank you. Bruce, Bob. <clears throat> uh, Pedro and uh, Fred, congratulations on bringing this plan in for me. Uh, we used to have a saying in management, I'm going to be there for the crash landing, I'd like to be there for the takeoff. Fred, you've been there since the takeoff. <laughs> I have a question in regard back to the, uh, to the uh, licensing aspect of it. I see that you have the National Marine Manufacturers Association on board as a supporter. Are they involved in some of the, the, uh, the building of the voter education portion? Uh, they're not involved with the voter education portion, but they and some other organizations have expressed interest, and uh, we haven't, we're have waiting for the plan to be finalized, but there is some interest in uh, doing some uh, stewardship projects of some sort. Uh, we haven't really figured out what those might be, but I think there is uh, wide interest among those organizations that are up on that, that slide to participate in uh, enhancing the park protection as well as promoting uh, responsible use and enjoyment of the park. So those are just some, you know, conversations we've had with representatives from some of those organizations, but we haven't really scoped out what that might be. But that, that will be a follow-up test, one of those implementation efforts that we, when we talk about, you know, where the resources are going to come from to actually put the plan more than, you know, not even on the bookshelf, but actually see results um, in the resources and on the water. Uh, we'll be talking to those organizations uh, like we do with many other organizations to help uh, uh, work through how we see action and improvements uh, within the parks and look forward to those discussions. Well, I think it's a, a good benefit for you to make sure that you get linked in with the MMA because they are the, like they are popular like when it comes to the boating industry and boating in general. I also see that you have the recreational boating and fishing group in there too. Or <coughs> oh, um, which group was that? I'm sorry, Racial Boating and Fishing Foundation. Um, I'm not sure if they were on there or not, uh, but I know, um, uh, I'm trying to think who, so yeah, it was NMMA, uh, American Sport Fishing Association, IGFA, um, Coastal Conservation, 
Association, uh, Guy Harvey, um, and a, and a few, uh, Dillfish Association, uh, and a few others. But, uh, but yeah, we've had our primary discussion with them was NMME, and they've, um, again, I think they represent, or they, they work closely with, as you know, uh, a number of other organizations. So we look forward to uh, uh, working with them directly or uh, in concert with others to, to advance some of these, uh, these next steps. Thank you very much. And then if there's more time, we can uh, take a break and we'll come back to this after the break. We'll have a little bit of extra time. And then I'll have Billy Causey's uh, regional report up to about 11 30. So we do have a little bit of time afterwards, but I think maybe after Caroline, we'll take a break and we can come back with more questions after a break. Yeah.
look to that um, as they go through the process of developing this plan. It's also very interesting how the public view of, the, of this plan really changed over time. And I think maybe the, the Florida Keys is going through this, a similar process in relation to what, what needs to be in the sanctuary management plan um, to really protect the resources here. But um, I think it will be a, a great opportunity to, um, to, to look to that plan for, for, for ways of the sanctuary management plan can, can really protect the resources down here. Um, for the, on the Florida Bay issues, um, I wanted to sort of second support for um, what Caroline said. It's some kind of resolution, I think, from this body really asking for some movement forward on restoration projects will be very helpful. It's, it's really devastating what's going on in Florida Bay and this yellow fog up there and the dead sea grass is, is terrible to see. Um, so th this, this body actually has a lot of influence. Speaking, I guess, as myself, because everybody's lost it or not, I'm behind my clients here. I've been involved recently in sort of Miami work, and there's some South Bay workshops going on um, through the South Florida Water Management Districts. And there, they're talking about a lot of the um, operations through the C-111 spreader canal, some of the operations that are going on right now. And agriculture is disproportionately represented there. And unfortunately, sort of a lot of the decisions that can be made, they can be made sort of to benefit Florida Bay or to provide more flood control for, for ag up there. Um, I, I, it's, un, it's unfortunate that there's sort of that juxtaposition going on, but it, it, it's kind of true. And there, we need to be keeping the water, the canals higher, the heads higher, so that we have um, water in the wetlands down there that can be distributed to Florida Bay. Um, so, the folks in this uh, and on the SAC would actually be very welcome voices in that process and through the, those South Bay workshops and through the South Florida Water Management District. Um, so if, if anyone would like to participate or learn more about those, please get in touch with me and I'll let you know. But I, I think it's really going to be important um, in this situation in Florida Bay. The people are, who are affected by it as users are engaged in the process and engaged. Um, through, through these discussions going on and how we're going to address operations and how we're going to be better distributing water to Florida Bay or providing flood control in South Miami Day. We <laughs> should pick, pick which one, but um, we, we need more voices down there from people who are affected in the Bay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Um, one of the things I've tried to do or wanted to try to implement is uh, after public discussion or public comment, a brief just a period of discussion if anybody has a comment on things that are brought up during public comment. It's a time for just a sack to, because I've gone through a lot of time, I've gone to meetings and you bleed your heart out and then they go thank you and they move on. And it's like they never even heard you. And I want to at least, without engaging one-on-one -on -one the people that speak up there, I'd like to, after a public comment period, just, you know, a, a brief stack discussion. If there's something that we, if somebody feels needs to be acted on, I wanted to give us a chance to talk about that. So even though Julie's the only one that spoke today, if there's somebody, sounds like Susie would like to make a comment, I would like to have that period of time. Yeah, this is in line with what we were all discussing before the break and as well as what Julie brought up. And again, a discussion about possibly having something on the agenda in December for some sort of resolution. Um, from this body and, you know, to support uh, what Everglades National Park has done and is, is implementing and also to, you know, kind of join in with uh, the idea of we are downstream, the entire sanctuary, not just the Florida Bay portion of it, but all parts of the sanctuary are affected by this water, um, you know, having this restoration going to affect them, getting the water back here. So in thinking about the, putting something on the agenda, we should be maybe thinking about what type of issues to address. My question to throw out there is, who would we really be addressing um, for, to, to, to you know, get some sort of a solidarity, you know, to, to have, do we, do we uh, you know, direct this towards water management, the state, the, the, you know, it looks like shop. 
Um, so in, in terms of your resolutions, your resolutions, uh, they, they would come to me. But in, in this case, the best um, route would be for me to uh, take it to me. And then this kind of goes up the chain um, through no. And, and uh, we can also run it up the chain through the state Department of Environmental Protection. But on the NOAA side, um, it, you know, I'd be kind of passing it on to Billy, and Billy would, it, would he, he was sort of the staff lead for uh, the South Florida uh, Ecosystem Restoration Task Force, which NOAA sits on, uh, it's the Department of Commerce sits on. Um, that would probably be the best, the target. The best target to hit. Um, then that way, uh, that representative of the Department of Commerce, which is always a known person, um, kind of has that in hand for, for anything. And we can include past resolutions uh, that have also addressed similar issues uh, regarding the other lakes restoration. They have task force from the last one. That sounds really good. And it's also maybe an opportunity. We've heard so much from other uh, uh, fishermen and people like that that have commented about the water quality issues and, and uh, those type of things that we could maybe have some common ground and, and show some solidarity supporting <coughs> sanctuary wide uh, a lot of us to, for this idea to be you know make a strong statement. I agree. Any other comments? I can't uh, see people down yes. there very well, so you got to. I, I was doing it. Okay, I'm good. All right. Short way down. All right. Jerry Ellis, Mayor of Key Colony Beach, uh, I would like to make this recommendation. The resolution is an excellent idea. And where I would start is with our local governments. If you take your resolution to Key Colony Beach, ask them to adopt it in their meeting, and now they are on record supporting your resolution. And it, in terms of politics, you need to start at the grassroots, and the grassroots is, is with your local government. You start there, you get their support, and now you have a, a presence when you go to NOAA or any to the state or to the uh, state representative. Holly Rashine would be another one that you would want to approach with a resolution, and uh, that would be my recommendation. But it's an excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you. Typically, our resolutions go from we advise the sanctuary advisory, uh, the sanctuary manager. That's kind of where our resolutions have historically gone. Separate resolution. But a separate, yeah, I guess a separate resolution. And, and get, yeah, I'm certainly getting municipalities on board is it's you know, it's a no-brainer. It's yeah. a great idea. Thank you, uh, Dave, and then George. George. Yeah, I was just going to suggest one of the reasons why I I. Uh, welcome having uh, the municipalities sit here is, is just come to mind because the sequence would follow is we would develop a resolution and we would pass it on to Sean and then George and you and uh, Mayor Cates and others would take it back, take what we've said back and say we agree with the sanctuary and we have our own resolution and then you would find out where to pass that up the chain so that they know there really is a united front. So I think that's the way it has to work. We don't, we don't reach out to you as part of this body. You take what we say back and ask your group. Is that correct, Sean? Is that sort of the, I mean, in terms of policy, our, our resolution goes to you is what I'm saying. Yeah. In terms of the process. In, in terms of the voting body following our, you know, Violence. That 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 comes to me, but there's no reason that a mirror resolution couldn't go to any anybody, um, you know, in the keys or, or beyond. You would bring that resolution, your resolution, to us, and we would vote on that resolution to adopt it or not. And that's I have one on my desk right now on plastic bags for God's sake at the grocery store. A resolution. I mean, geez, that's typically how that works. And when they're looking for grassroots support, they bring these these resolutions around and they try to get local communities to, to back them. And then they have a voice that that kind of gives them a foundation of well, who's in support of you. Well, I have these local communities that are governments that are in support of it, and it's it's a place a way to go. And I think you would get the support of all. I mean, I think this is something that would help you in the long run. That's all I'm suggesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, George, go ahead. Uh, well, I just want to, we, we've done this already uh, with resolutions being uh, supported by the county commission uh, that the Sanctuary Advisory Council has passed. And that way, uh, there, there's no misinterpretation of what we're supporting. It was passed by the Sanctuary Advisory Council and it's supported by the county. And having all the municipalities on board is something that just reinforces yeah. that local government uh, support for this particular issue. And I think it's something that uh, Jerry's exactly right on, that uh, uh, get the resolution done as soon as possible, and then we'll, we'll present it at the, uh, the local government's uh, commission meetings. Okay, thank you, George. My, my point was that the council doesn't just send the resolutions to other people without going through Sean first. Um, we can send it to Sean and ask Sean to present it to the different municipalities if you like that. So there's kind of a way that these things tend to go and uh, the right way to do it the wrong way. Um, Chris? This is just a follow up. Uh, the meetings that, that Julie uh, referred to, the South Bay uh, Wetlands um, Management Operations, I assume those are public meetings? They're public meetings to the South Florida Water Management District, which is the South Bay version. Um, they're public posted on the website, but like I said, if you can get in touch with me, I can make sure. Well, rather, rather than each one of us potentially getting yeah. in touch with you, if you could just give that to, that can go into the minutes, it can go into an email yeah. out to the list server, because I agree it's very important and, you know, agriculture is really important, as is uh, Florida Bay's uh, ecology and, and uh, all the industries that go along with it and finding the balance is critical. If they're having those discussions, um, many of us may want to participate. Yeah, it would be great to have folks here participating in those. Um, once I get the reminder for the next meeting, I'm not sure what said, but yeah, I can forward it to the entire staff. <coughs> Pete, and then I'd like to try to close it up and get on to the next seven. Sure, so just like to say, we've all heard over and over and over again from uh, the fishing community, water quality problems, the water quality problems with these issues that we see in Florida Bay, sanctuary waters. That's the biggest complaint, at least I've heard, is water quality. You gotta fix the water quality before anything else. Well, you know, here's, the time is now, here it is, you have, tangible, visible water quality issues, <coughs> problems going on. And now is the time where the fishing community can help and get involved. And I've been hearing from angling and some of the guide community that they want to get involved. So those representing fishing constituents here, this is the time, this is a way you, know, you guys can help get involved here. Try to attend some of these meetings, support resolutions, come up with your own resolution. Because this is it. And you know, we can talk about it, or we can do something. So I hope we can get more involved with what's going on. Uh, I'm directing that up at fishing. Great. And uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our next agenda. It's not actually on the agenda until 2 o'clock, 2.15, but it's agency reports. And we'd like to move to uh, building regional director's report up to right now. We talked about that earlier. And, uh, you know, we got 15 minutes, but take more if it runs into it. Well, I just know how these things go, but, <laughs> but I think this is an important discussion. Though. Don't give him more. He's supposed to give you. So you're going to take it anyway. Ken, Ken, you're very tactful. Let me, uh, let me go up here. Sean? Um, Keep in mind that there is only 15 minutes on the agenda okay. for the whole agency reports. Okay. And, and, and so you're getting 15 extra bonus Thank rollover you. minutes. These are extra rollover minutes. All right. First, uh, I'd like to first uh, ask uh, Lori McLaughlin, would you would you come up here, please? Uh, for those of you that may or may not know, uh, Lori has joined my Southeast Regional team, and she's been uh, a very capable. Uh, person for us, but um, Lori, um, Sean and I would like to present you with your 15-year certificate. Awesome. And 
your 15-year uh, pen for service to the U.S. government. I hired Lori in, 19, in early 1987 when I was managing Luke Key National Youth Sanctuary. She came over as the education coordinator. And I hired her after she had been volunteering for us to help me install mooring buoys in some of the deep, uh, inter, in the intermediate reef habitat. And she was free diving tubs of cement down to me in 45 feet, handing them to me and hanging out for a while before she'd go up. And she did that all day long. And I said, I, I'm going to figure out a way to hire that. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Thank you for all that you do, Lord. <laughs> Okay, um, what, um, what I'm going to be doing, I, I'm going to need this, the selector or the bench. Oh, it's over. Is it over here? Okay, excellent. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick update on some of the southeast regional activities that have been going on. Um, and, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to start with this map right here that will give you an idea of some of the things that are happening in this region. One of the focuses that we've had lately has been sanctuary nominations uh, around the country. And uh, you, if you look at these, I, I just want to sort of touch on some of these. Um, we already have the Flower Garden Banks National Union Sanctuary, but they're looking at, at site expansion right now. And their management plan, they have a, a working group that has a, a recommended uh, expansion to the east to a number of banks and pinnacles along that area and they're in the process of developing their EIS and uh, although I, I can't tell you specifically the range of alternatives I can tell you that uh, there are alternatives that, that cover a number of the banks and pinnacles to the east and then we have the, the Florida Keys and what you all have been doing down here in the way of boundary expansion uh, there, there's a number of things that you have recommended that you're looking at so we have a lot of activity there. Gray's Reef is at a, an exciting point. Um, it's only 17 square nautical miles in size, but they're looking at uh, uh, Sarah uh, Fangman, who is our superintendent there, has pulled together a working group of the advisory council who are now going to be looking at other areas outside uh, Gray's Reef. It's a sedimentary rock reef, and I won't go into any detail about that right now. But it's a spectacular area, and they do a, a tremendous amount of research there. But uh, they are looking at eventually moving on other areas. Now, we've had some sites that have been, uh, they actually have not submitted nominations yet, except for Northeast Florida. But we have a number of sites that, where the public has expressed a great deal of interest in a sanctuary in, the, in their area. Um, I will talk about Northeast Florida because we did get a nomination from uh, on the Eubelina Aquilina National Union Sanctuary. The, the Friends of the Matanzas River uh, came together. Uh, they made a recommendation. They put together a, a nomination package. They submitted it uh, to us, NOAA, for review. We reviewed it. The first uh, package was um, uh, we sent it back and said we need more detail. And one of the things that was was mentioned is that if they exclude the state waters, then it won't be so controversial. Well, um, so they did. They came back with a second nomination, and they excluded state, state waters, and it made it to the second round of reviews in our program. And when we came together, our scientists, uh, uh, our, our, bi our biologists, our maritime heritage uh, uh, expert, as well as our social economic expert, all three of them said, hey, this is a good proposal, but if they had state waters, it would be a lot better. <laughs> so we, we realized at that point that we had, we, we had them in a circular position, and, and uh, they decided at this point in time with the, the climate that we have in Florida, and that's as much as I'll say about the climate, uh, that, that they would put it on hold uh, for a period of time so they took it back, they withdrew their nomination for this, this point in time, but it will be coming forward again uh, in the future. 
Uh, we've had two, uh, this is the SEFCRI area. The reason I have a question mark there is that, uh, and I think Joanna could really support me on this, but I'm not going to put her on the spot. But there's been a lot of interest in a sanctuary in the southeast uh, Florida area. There's been talk about the benefits and the possibilities, and then there's been uh, the same kind of controversy that we ran into in North, northeast Florida, we ran into in southeast Florida. That too is, we have a group that are interested in putting together a, a steering committee for a nomination package, but they haven't moved forward yet. I don't know what the status is there, we just know that we still have people interested. I've been getting a lot of phone calls from people around Charlotte Harbor. Um, there is a group there in Charlotte Harbor, uh, Sanibel area, that are keenly interested in a National Marine Sanctuary. And they're going to be holding a big fundraiser in February, and they have a whole list of uh, 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 VIPs that they're inviting and, and some keynote presenters already committed. So you're going to start seeing more activity around this area eventually. Down here is, in Puerto Rico, is an exciting place, and this is where we're sort of picking up our tent stakes and spending more time in Puerto Rico. George Sedbury, uh, who is another one of our regional colleagues, is down there right now as, as I speak, and the government of Puerto Rico, the Department of Natural and Environmental Protection, is interested in two to three more and maybe four more sanctuaries in the vicinity of Puerto Rico. So uh, we're, we're starting to work down there with uh, and by work, I mean we're just providing, answering questions to a steering committee that is already starting to draft up a proposal. People involved are, are scientists from the University of Puerto Rico. We have people involved from various uh, conservation groups in, in Puerto Rico. And we have some of the fishing groups that are, are keenly interested. So this is exciting. We're going to, I think it's pretty safe country for us right now because the government wants us there. And, or at least the, the territorial government, so uh, we're, we're going to be working down there for a period of time. I'm going to move on now, but I think if you've heard me speak in the last 10 or 12 years, you've seen this, uh, this map. And that is, these are all satellite trackers, and it really shows the connectivity. When these trackers were deployed, each color is a different tractor, a tracker, you can see how they have traveled through the wider, you know, through the wider Caribbean region. And you can see that there are spots, there are areas where there are gyres, this one right here, pay particular attention to that because that is down here in the, in the southwest end of Cuba. Um, all of this gets up into the loop current, comes past and through the Florida Keys, on up off, off of Cape Sable and, and or Cape, uh, Cape Hatteras and so on. So it really shows a great deal of connectivity. This one shows it in another way. This is uh, the, the, bluer, the bluer the color, the, the fresher the water. And you can see how the Amazon and, and the Amazon and the Orinoco have a huge influence on, on the Atlantic down here as, by way of how much fresh water gets into the system. But you can also see what's happening in the northern Gulf. This clearly shows you the, the, the connectivity that exists throughout the region. But let's just take one critter that we, we know of and, and watch this clock up here. Watch the, the, the clock. And this is the lionfish. You can see there's one dot off of the Miami area, 91. You can see it. You've probably seen this before, but this one covers a little more time span. But it does show you clearly how one, one critter, harmful or not, can spread using the currents and the connectivity in the area. So if we're, if we're working to, to benefit the area, if we're working to, say, for instance, we'll, isn't that amazing? Just, it just, it's a little bit scary. I, I'm going to let it run through again. How much time? Okay, um, it takes off pretty fast right here, but they didn't hit the keys until January of 2009. So you, you, you may recall how quickly they moved in or on around, all the way around uh, the Gulf. So this is, a, this is an issue, but also not only that thing that carried with the currents, but also mm -hmm. um, other forms. You've heard me talk in the past about um, some of the banks and pinnacles that exist throughout the region. Uh, this, these are just some of them, and the reason I put this up there is that we have been working since 2007 with uh, the Mexicans and the Cubans in informal <coughs> venues. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, Heart Research Institute, uh, Moulton Marine Laboratory, a number of uh, environmental defense funds have, have formed these um, uh, 
uh, these trinational meetings. And by the way, we're about to have our seventh trinational meeting next month in Havana, which will be uh, just prior to the Marcuba Scientific Conference. But um, this is one that we had at Heart Research Institute back in 2010, and this was more of a governance uh, issue. But we have a mixture of, of uh, uh, Cuban and uh, uh, Mexican scientists along with U.S. scientists. Uh, this is Maritza Garcia. Garcia, she's the star of a lot of what we do, uh, and uh, she, you'll see her in a lot of these photographs. This was another meeting, another tri-national meeting. The only reason I put these up there is that they, uh, not only does it represent a lot of people interested in very similar issues, but it, it presents a, a great deal of, of collaboration that's going on currently. Cuba is, ha, has a tremendous system of protected areas. Over 20% of their coast is protected around Cuba already. And, and they're looking at moving that to 25%. Mexico is doing a phenomenal job with many of their areas uh, around uh, the tip of the Yucatan and on around to Veracruz. So we've been working both with the Cubans and the Mexicans talking about ways to approach our management. Well, speed ahead a few years and speed ahead to the president's announcement in uh, December when he announced that he was going to use everything within his executive powers to move towards normalization with Cuba. And that's that's it was December. We had already, we being uh, uh, NOAA, had already been asked by the State Department to submit 12 projects that would go, would be reviewed and would go to the Cuban government and they would pick three of those projects for approval. Uh, one of them was uh, Bluefin Tuna Research, one was charting and uh, mapping in, in, in some areas in Cuba, and the, the third, which actually they picked first, was a marine protected area network sister sanctuary uh, pro proposal. And we submitted that, and we didn't talk about it much. You didn't see any media coverage of it. But, but in March, we had our first <coughs> official meeting uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Pedro was there, uh, a key player uh, representing the National Park Service. But this was the meeting we, we, we were hosted by the uh, by Nova University, Dick Dodge and his crew, and we met at, at the, uh, what's now the Guy Harvey Oceanographic Center, and uh, we had discussions about what we could do by way of implementing this proposal and looking at establishing a, a memorandum of a, a understanding between uh, Cuba and the U.S. to set aside some areas. We had a great meeting. At that meeting, within, within the first day, I think Pedro could correct me, but I think within the first day we had a sense that we were going to do something very positive collectively and that we were going to be moving towards um, some sort of agreement. Uh, and this is Maritza, I told you, she's, uh, Maritza just recently was promoted. She's at the minister level now, so, but she has been working with us all along. Um, we had a number of people from the U.S. State Department, from NOAA, and from National Park Service as well as our, our Cuban colleagues. That one was it, that was in March, and we had a number of things. What we agreed at that meeting is that we would meet again, and, and the Cubans said, we want you to come to Cuba in July. But in the meantime, we had been working already with our, our uh, uh, partners in Mexico, and the Nature Conservancy, Bob Bendick and some of his folks, took a leadership role in helping fund some of the activities that we were doing with with Mexico and we've had a great partnership along the way but we're doing the same thing with Mexico and that is looking at a sister sanctuary network between uh, Mexico and the US. Sean uh, and uh, our superintendent from Fly Garden Banks, uh, GP Schmall and I went down and Bill Keeney who is um, again another one of our regional uh, colleagues and we met with the Mexicans for for two days. Uh, we had a, a great number of discussions. At that meeting, we drafted a, a draft MOU. We are just steps from getting it signed. And again, it's establishing a sister sanctuary network that would allow for sharing of resources, collaboration, education, outreach, science, and so on. There, we're also looking at the, the sanctuaries, that, the areas that would be 
uh, included there would be the coral reef system off of Veta Cruz, off of Lobos Tuxpan, off of the uh, 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 uh several whale shark sites out here on the tip, because the whale sharks that are out here make their way up to the flower gardens. The whale sharks off of Cuba make their way, they mix here, they all make their way up there, so there's a lot of connectivity between our resources already that's naturally. But we're looking at, at, at sistering uh, the, the Florida Keys and, and, and these sites out here with, and with the fly gardens and also, well, and, and, and this would be the, the network of Mexican sites that would sister with the fly garden banks in Florida Keys. Again, we've made a, a great deal of progress. Uh, great meetings. This uh, person here, Ricardo, he's my counterpart in the Mexican government. He has all the, the marine protected areas and all the parks on the tip end for all of the Yucatan. Um, jump ahead to July. Just this July, Pedro and I had the, the privilege and honor to go down and join. Oh, gosh. Go ahead and finish. Okay, I'm about there. But anyway, we went down and, and met with our, our Cuban colleagues. We spent a few days down there. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, we went down to the uh, Pinar del Rio, uh, Cuba, and we were at the Guanajacabibes uh, National Park. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. But we had, again, we had very formal meetings, very formal settings, uh, interpreters back and forth and back and forth. But we, we, cert we also uh, agreed on a number of things that we felt that we could do together and start moving towards uh, implementation. Again, a great group of people. Uh, 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 besides uh, Pedro, there he is right here. Elsa, you may know Elsa from uh, Biscayne National Park. I think she was here at your last meeting. Uh, they were partners as well as some of our other representatives. Our acting director, John Armour, led our delegation. And we had, again, people from the State Department and uh, uh, NOAA that were represented. This is uh, Guanajacabibas. Um, it is the southwest tip. If you go out here, we went to some of the turtle nesting beaches. And if you go out here to this very tip, that's the westernmost part of, of Cuba. And it, it's an exciting area. And what we plan to do here is that um, if you look at this portion, this is the... Guanajacabibas National Park Biosphere Reserve. And then up here is an area called the Banco de San Antonio. And um, we're planning on sistering the, the park with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, with Dry Tortugas, Biscayne, Everglades. And we're going to sister the Banco de San Antonio with the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. The reason is that the features are very much the same at the two locations. They are just starting to experience more tourism in that area. It's about a five mile, five hour drive out of Havana. Pretty rough drive, sort of bouncy, but, but they're, they're still a little bit remote, but you can see that they're ready to, to ramp up. And uh, so there's a lot that we can share with them uh, in, in various ways, catch them while they, they have the resources are healthy. The Banco de San Antonio, there's going to be a lot of, of research opportunities there comparing what's going on at the Banco. They're, they're very similar to Flower Gardens, except Flower Gardens does not have any soft corals, um, none whatsoever. So that's the only difference, but they're in some of the fish species. But for the most part, they both are about, the shallowest points are about 58, 60 feet deep. Um, they are very similar in structure, very similar in we have more boulder corals at, at Flower Gardens, but still, there's a lot of similarities there, and, a, and they have a lot of threats uh, to that area. They're concerned. They have threats. They, they ask us questions about oil and gas development. They ask us concerns about cruise ships. All the things that we talk about here. We can't be in a conversation with them for five minutes, either the Mexicans or the Cubans, without talking about lionfish and what we can do collectively about lionfish. So there, there's a lot of opportunity there for us working together. We're real excited. We're real close. And we're wordsmithing an MOU with Cuba. Uh, Secretary uh, John Kerry at the uh, um, our, our Oceans Conference in Chile in the first part of October, the first day, he announced this uh, agreement along with he announced the, the uh, we were moving towards uh, uh, nomination of two 
Nashville sanctuaries in the system. But the thing that was most exciting about his announcement is that his announcement was on the, on the first, first part of the first day. The very first panel was a Marine Protected Area panel. And at the end of that, they took official comments from delegates in, in the audience. And one of our counterparts from Cuba stood up and read a proclamation that, that they had put together identifying and recognizing our sister sanctuary relationship. So it was really uh, gratifying and certainly uh, rewarding to all of us. Pedro, what did I leave out? You did a good job, and I think we're over 15 minutes. I did. I did. <laughs> that bell was 15 minutes. <laughs> Chris. Um, um, so, Sister Sanctuaries, it sounds like that's not establishing new uh, marine protected areas. It's taking existing ones, sharing information, sharing science, sharing whatever resources. Is that accurate? That's, it. that's very accurate. And uh, we've done this before in the sanctuary program. Uh, we have uh, the Dominican Republic is sistered with uh, the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Their, their, their humpback whales or, or our humpback whales up there as they go back and forth. Same thing, with, uh, we're, we're trying to urge the Cubans to join the same partnership. But it's a way to uh, formally recognize that there's a connection between the sites and that there's a way that if we share resources, we, we can't spend money down there, we, we, can't, we can't give them money, we can't support the project. But what we can do is, is share resources, share ideas, and, and certainly collaborate. I would just editorialize. I got to visit the Wanaka Beach Basin Park um, three years ago. It's an incredible place, and it's really remote and really un, um, relatively unimpacted compared to what we have here in Florida and even other parts of Cuba. Uh, but speaking of um, money and resources, uh, their scientists and park rangers were bumming rides off of tourists to get from one end of the park to the other. They had, they had no resources. And um, you know, there's obviously the, the argument that that's one of the reasons why the place isn't uh, so degraded. But uh, it, obviously development is coming uh, to Cuba, and I think it's a great opportunity uh, for us to share lessons learned, uh, bad ones, good ones, and uh, it's really exciting for me. Right. Do they have advisory councils? Hmm? Do they have advisory bodies? No. <laughs> the party. <laughs> the bill he has offered out of his regional budget is take the entire four keys It take us ten years to get those bases. <laughs> Any other questions? I think people are hungry. All right. Good deal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, let's be back by 1.30. Oh, sorry. Go get some snails. Are we good? So, I'm, I'm just going to quickly introduce um, uh, uh, Dan Dorfman. Uh, you guys have uh, seen Dan before. Uh, but Dan's been working um, very hard uh, on kind of what our, our latest, you know, kind of where we are with our uh, management plan um, and, and writing the draft environmental impact statement. Um, we'll cover a little bit more in terms of sort of process, uh, kind of where we stand and next steps uh, sort of at the end. But, um, you know, this is sort of that phase where we've got to, you know, we're doing a bunch of internal work um, doing the analysis. Uh, on, uh, on on all of the the different proposals that we heard, looking at the goals um, and objectives that came out of the advisory council, the uh, all the different ideas that came out of the working groups and up through the advisory council and what got added on, um, and so that's it, it, we're we're working uh, through that process right now. We've also you know you heard at the last meeting uh, from Bob Leeworthy. Um, who's, uh, his team is working on sort of the economic side of that. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do was bring Dan in here and talk about sort of the, the natural resource side of things. There's a little bit of the human use, but, but mostly how we're, how we're using um, the pretty much most cutting edge tools we've got in, in doing that analysis. And, and so uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dan and then uh, we'll, 
we'll uh, be talking a little bit at the end about kind of process and next steps. But for the week, again. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, I, uh, I'm a marine spatial planner and I've been working with the Keys staff to support the uh, process of uh, management plan revision. Um, and I wanted to talk today about a decision support system that we set up to help us evaluate the alternatives that came out of the working groups and uh, how we've been working through that process. Um, I think I can advance slides. Yes. So our first step in this process was a biogeographic assessment. This was the process where we went out and we collected all the information we had available on the sanctuary uh, from an ecological and biological perspective. This was all the surveys of where endangered corals were located, uh, fish abundance, uh, habitat distributions, um, all the, the scientific information uh, specifically related to natural resources. So we looked at where benthic habitats were distributed, uh, the condition and distribution of corals, and the abundance of fish. <coughs> um, and this is a, a map of this information. Uh, the lower side is the benthic habitat map, uh, which was a collection of a bunch of different uh, bunch of different efforts that was stitched together to give us a feel for the distribution of habitats across the sanctuary. And on the top is thousands of on-site, in-situ observations of corals and fish. We piled all of this information together to give us a sense of where things were uh, and what was important throughout the sanctuary. And we came up with uh, a little more than 40, between 40 and 50 different elements or features that we thought were important to keep track of in terms of representing and protecting the natural resources throughout the sanctuary. Um, we looked at habitat types, we looked at fish aggregations, we looked at coral species and condition, uh, abundance of fish. Um, we looked at a, a number of different groups, not just how many fish, but certain types of fish, not just how many corals, but different types of corals. Um, and then we took all of this information and used it to support a working group process. Uh, the working group process, uh, the advisory council, you guys, established the shallow water working group and an ecological protection working group uh, to assist in reviewing the sanctuary marine zones. These groups were led through the process where we showed them all these data sets that we collected through the biogeographic assessment. And they took this information along with information that they brought to the table that they collected from their stakeholders, their understanding of the local environment. And they used this to propose a suite of recommendations for how these uh, existing areas might be modified, particularly management zones within the sanctuary. Um, so they were looking at things like wildlife management areas and where they were and maybe where they ought to be. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the Sanctuary Advisory Council reviews and provides additional input for analysis to draft an environmental impact statement. Uh, the Shallow Water Working Group looked at the wildlife management areas, 27 of them. Uh, they reviewed, reviewed 25 additions, proposed new ideas. Uh, and came up with a final recommendation out of that working group process uh, to remove two of the existing zones, to keep seven the way they were, to modify 19 of the zones, and to add 24 new ones. The Ecological Protection Working Group went through a similar process. They reviewed the sanctuary preservation areas, the special use areas, the ecological reserves, the existing management areas and the boundaries as well of the sanctuary, as well as the areas to be avoided. Uh, and they came up with a set of recommendations to modify 11 of the existing marine zones, uh, to modify the sanctuary and the areas to be avoided. Uh, they proposed seven new zones, and they removed catch and release by trawling, exception for four of these zones. Uh, so, Coming out of the 
working groups. We wanted to review the working group recommendations and the advisory council recommendations. And essentially, we wanted them to meet this set of goals. We want them to improve the diversity of natural biological communities, to protect and where appropriate restore and enhance natural habitats, populations, and ecological processes overall in each of these subregions. We wanted to reduce stress from human activities. We want to protect large, continuous, di contiguous, diverse, and interconnected habitats. And we want to increase abundance and condition of selected key species. This is a tremendously complex problem to try and solve. The, the answer to how you would accomplish these four goals across the sanctuary it is not an easy nut to crack. Uh, the decision, the working groups did an excellent job of taking advantage of thousands upon thousands of pieces of information and trying to sort through that along with local knowledge and figure out what was happening. Um, to evaluate what they came up with, we want to apply a decision support system uh, which we can use uh, in an automated way to review all of these different possible scenarios and come up with some sort of criteria by which we can evaluate the, essentially the merits of each of these proposed alternatives. So we went looking for an appropriate tool and settled on Marxin. Marxin is a decision support tool which is used for identifying ecologically important areas and designing net networks for natural resource management. Uh, it came out of the uh, Possingham Lab at the University of Queensland, um, and it's been in wide use now for maybe 15 years, a little more than 15 years. Uh, it's a software tool that supports the use of a systematic optimization algorithm, which is to say that you give it a set of criteria and it optimizes or finds the best possible or, or uh, most efficient solution to a given set of criteria. Uh, it's been used all over the world to support the design of marine and terrestrial reserves, and it's the most widely used conservation planning tool with more than 5,000 users in 180 <coughs> countries. It's broadly accepted, well supported in the scientific literature. So we felt confident that this was an appropriate tool to apply to this kind of a problem. So Mark's Hand is designed to find efficient solutions to complex problems and incorporate spatial considerations. So it's not just a, a optimization tool, it's a spatial optimization tool. It looks across space and finds areas which, when configured together, produce an optimal result for a given set of criteria. Uh, in this case, it's the criteria that came out of this committee, the working group goals and objectives, that we then feed into this decision support tool and ask it what would be an appropriate set or area, portfolio of sites, that would represent the goals that we established. To make this operational, we took the sanctuary and divided it up into 21,000 planning units. We used hexagons. Uh, they're each about a half, they're each exactly 50 hectares or a half a square kilometer. And what the tool does is it sorts through and evaluates if you were to select some of these hexagons and establish them as management areas, then what proportion of your criteria from your original objectives would be met. And we sorted through more than 120 billion possible combinations of these hexagons to say, if you were to look at different configurations of these hexagons, which setup would best meet your criteria? And the criteria we gave it was specific representation goals for benthic habitat types, for fish and for corals, uh, for resilient reefs, for reefs with high rugosity, um, all of the different aspects that we established prior to the working group process that we said these are the things we're looking to protect or to represent. Uh, we then uh, chose to 
represent these things across their range of variability, which is to say across the five regions of the sanctuary. Uh, and we ended up with 235 specific goals or representation criteria. We wanted to see that in an <coughs> optimal scenario. Now, it's important to remember that when we use this tool, it's only using the spatial information that we provided based on the benthic habitat map and the exist existing scientific research that we had available. So it, it doesn't take into account local knowledge. Um, it doesn't take into account uh, human use patterns. Uh, purely based on an ecological and biological set of criteria, we said, what is the best way to represent these 235 different things across the space of the sanctuary. And we get a result that looks like this. Essentially, if we used 8% of the analysis units in this particular pattern, then we represent all of those 235 goals in the smallest area possible. Um, but it's not the only possible configuration. It's important to recognize two things. One, that this may be most optimal according to the criteria, but there are many near optimal solutions that could be spatially different. Um, and also, the, the set of criteria that we punch into this decision support system is not the whole ballgame. There are other considerations which will cause us to, to change our final answer from being what pops out of a decision support system to uh, acceptable criteria for managing natural resources. Uh, so we ran the scenario that pops out that one answer a hundred independent times and we said in a hundred independent scenarios where we looked at a hundred million different versions of the configuration of the hexagons, we find this as a sort of a heat map or a summary of the results from 100 independent trials. And what this tells us is where we can find variability, spatial variability in particular, in how we might choose to represent our goals. So these are, the red areas are good places for us to go to reach uh, representation of ecological and biological criteria. <coughs> What I'm doing now is showing them with the outlines of the existing spas, SUAs, ERs, wildlife management areas, etc. Uh, so that you can kind of get a feel for how this looks compared to the existing system. The existing system takes up roughly 10% of the area of the sanctuary and it doesn't meet all of the ecological representation criteria the way we define them in the decision support system but it does a good job of getting part way there, uh, which is to say that you could add another 3% and, and uh, reach all of the ecological representation criteria that are outlined in the uh, pure decision, uh, purely ecological representation. Uh, that's a lot of information fast. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, you said 10%. Yeah. And I've often heard that, I guess it's 6%. Mike? Is the. No, that's Mike. So 10%. I've often heard that it's roughly 6% is in no take or marine reserve status or spas or whatever, places you can't fish. So is the other 4% the existing management areas or what? Wildlife management areas? Yes, there's, there's other types of, of zoning that apply there. There's the existing management areas. You can see the Key Largo, uh, the uh, Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary, Blue Key, and, and then the wildlife management areas as well. And then there's there's other areas that are kind of shown on there that are kind of open and open for development in Portuguese uh, style. It, it, it makes a little bit there's also one other factor playing a small role in that, which is that in this scenario, we've lumped things into these half kilometer hexagons. So when we measure, say, the sanctuary, there's a little rough edge around the edge here, which is to say that we needed 
hexagons that filled the sanctuary. And in order to avoid leaving any place out, we have a little bit of overlap. So when we select a particular, let's say, spa, and measure it in hexagons, as opposed to measuring it straight as a line feature, we have just a little bit more area included in that map. If you take out the tortugas, it's one half of one percent. Just to put another number on the table. Not much. Not much is the answer. No. Yes. No. That one, and that depends, that depends on what you're doing. We ran the numbers several right. meetings. Yeah. 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 That's. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, first pause. Yes. If, if, if you're looking at you know ecological reserves and yeah. it's pause, and oh. it's it's, uh, it's more than that. So. But, it, you know, I mean, this is a lot of information kind of really quick. And, and it's cool. folks who, who, who uh, grinded it out in the, in the Ecosystem Protection Working Group, you know, this is, this is basically modeling the same data that you guys, that, that you guys had and then, and then running the analysis uh, through this tool. And, and, and so how, how are we using this tool? Um, it's, it, it, it's it's a, it allows us to do a comparative. As, as we take all the different ideas that, that come forward, we lump them, we split them into various alternatives. We, we weren't going to have 220 different alternatives in, in a draft EIS, and we lump them together based on the goals that were, that were put forward by the advisory council. And this is a tool that, that can, we can kind of almost quantitatively, not almost, we quantitatively compare, uh, you know, um, which ones can, can meet which goals, and, and, and it provides a, uh, a scientific way of doing a compare and contrast across those alternatives and ideas as, as they've all been put forward. Um, and, and we can continue to use the tool uh, uh, as it, you know, tweaks happen along the way, uh, and also if there were, um, and as, as was put forward by the advisory council, to look at areas that work um, that meet the goals and objectives that the advisory council put forward, but but, but weren't necessarily uh, didn't come up through the working group, so that the, the various alternatives can you know can, can kind of show all of this. Yeah. I have a question. So so I'm just trying to remember what you said. So about 10 percent of the existing waters of the sanctuary are in some sort of zoning that is other than the general sanctuary. And you said with 13%, you could meet all of those complicated, challenging objectives that that this SAC established, its goals and objectives? Yes. That's amazing. And also, the implicit in that assumption is they don't all have to be no-take reserves. There are many kinds of management zones so you're not, this isn't saying, you're not leading up to saying we need 13% no-take in the sanctuary to accomplish those objectives. You're saying we need 13% of some sort of management other than or on top of the existing general regs for the sanctuary that would help accomplish all of those objectives. Right, we made no attempt to determine what exactly form of management would be required to protect a particular or individual resource but just said, if we wanted to achieve this set of goals, uh, ecological representation, then these are the areas where we would do it, but we didn't decide how. So then, uh, another related question. Uh, those of us that put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the working group process, I think we put a lot of ideas forward, recommendations as you described them, and it, it would be very interesting to all of us whether or not they ended up looking good or bad or indifferent through this analysis, just seeing how our recommendations square with this uh, analysis. Is, is that something that we'll be able to see all of the working group recommendations in relationship to this and how they would fare? And, and that's what I was trying to say is, we, we, as, as we've been talking about, you know, we're not going to parse them out all 220 and we had to do some lumping there and so we tried to lump them by whole and that's basically what our next step with with Dan is is taking these sort of optimized results um, you know and, and kind of compare as, as we want you know your ideas and I'm gonna pick on Ben so yours and Ben's you know you know if that's how it came together you know and for that one goal 
you know, I, I, uh, Susie and Pete's, uh, you know, kind of idea over here, that's meeting a different role that, you know, we can kind of compare and contrast there. As you move through the process of, okay, well, you know, we've got alternative one, two, three, right? Well, let's take a little bit of two, a little bit of three, or a little bit of four and see what happens there. That's, that's where you can kind of do a little bit more iterative work as, as, we, as, we, as we move on. But right now, it's, the, the, what you kind of see right here is, you know, this is, this is one way to qualitatively, from a science perspective, analyze all the things that have come forward and to, meet, and to address the direction we got from the advisory council is to look at what meets the goals and objectives. And, and that's kind of what Dan has been doing 140 billion times. So, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and it's it, you know it's complicated. Dan will tell you that you know, or he's told us that you know this. We are you know while it's not perfect data, just as like the term Bob Leeworthy would use, we have more data for the Florida Keys kind of ecosystem than uh, pretty much you know any other application of this tool has been done. You know, uh, in, in in this type of a habitat uh, uh, worldwide. I know there's more questions, and, and then I'll get into kind of next steps. Yeah, I have a question. Quick question for Dan. Sorry. Quick question for Dan. When you have your polygons relative to those variables, fish, seagrass, whatever, was there any magnitude, or was it just a yes or a no? It exists there, or it doesn't exist in a half square square kilometer. We did include a magnitude value. So it was how much seagrass, or in this area, was it this amount of contiguous seagrass or X amount of non-contiguous seagrass. So we didn't just say seagrass or not seagrass, but we further described, you know, here is how much coral and here is the condition, or here is how much seagrass. Do you have a problem with the scale of the benthic maps versus what you're doing? No. Um, just uh, my impression was that those orange reddish spots would have been that 13%. If you notice, it's not the same 10% that we have now. There's a lot of different areas. So um, fitting your so there's a there's a a complete rethought on what would be protected if we went by just that. And that's not obviously that's just a this academic. Exercise. I mean, I, I guess you know you have the whole uh, Key Largo Marine Sanctuary is one of this part of this ten percent, and yet the orange space is not. You know, it's like about a third of that. So there's other orange spaces. So, you know, we can't just add three more percent to what we have, and voila, we have it. It's not going to happen. That doesn't happen. No, there, there, there's a lot more work to be done. What yeah, we wanted yeah. to show is kind of the, the quantitative of the model and that's gone on here. Again, for the folks that were in the Ecosystem Protection Working Group, there was discussion early on about using this kind of a tool to give you the answer right off the bat. Yeah. And, and, and that I did two years of it, you could have just done the short before. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna address this one. I'm just kidding. Right on, because I addressed it at the time. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, because and so I'm, I'm, I have a glorious can't win position, you know, of, of, of doing it by other way. But the the folks, um, you know, for for yes, we could have gone away and, and put all this data in and come back and said, you know, this is a, nobody would have blame Dan, right? But it, it's it, that's not that's not really the way we wanted to do it, and, it, and it's important to, for everyone. You have the data, you just didn't have the 120 billion dollar billion runs and, and the, uh, but you, know, you had the data and it's important to go through that process um, it, getting that you know local <coughs> knowledge in there and then we're using the tool to be able to provide that kind of scientific model to, to compare and contrast and so you, it, it's it's an iterative process and we're going to kind of go through this a couple more times but uh, you know we wanted to kind of Show you this. That this is sort of how we're, one of one of the ways that we're evaluating uh, uh, what what everyone put forward. And, and like I said, we talked about 
it, you know, uh, what, what Bob Leeworthy, uh, the, the, our chief economist, and his team are doing on the sort of the human use, the economic, the social side. Uh, this looks at more of the trends more towards the natural resource side. Um, and as Ken just kind of said, it, it, there is no perfect answer. It, it takes a lot of work and it takes you, the advisory council, to go through this um, and, and, and as, as we move forward. So it's, it's, it's another tool in the toolbox and Dan's done a, you know, a heck of a lot of work uh, putting this together. But you know, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you this isn't the perfect answer. And anyone who's run Marxian type processes will also tell you, no, it's, it's, one, it's one more thing to look at. Um, and you know, it's, it's a support tool, it's not a decision tool. Um, it's, it's not the answer. So, um, Bruce, let's get the microphone. Well, I'm waiting for you guys to tell me who gets it. Bruce? Yeah. Bruce. I think we'll get the end of the you've done the yeah. work to reconcile the difference that Dan's come up with here, and I understand other places are different, different conditions, uh, but with the conclusion that Mark San has come up with, in, in regarding other protected areas, like the Barrier Reef, which is an order of magnitude, or order of magnitude, maybe three or four times larger in terms of recommended protected areas than, than what he's come up with. If I understand the question correctly, they, they uh, I didn't do it, but I know the people that did. Uh, they, that, this that's is what I meant. I wouldn't. Yeah, it's a personal question. Yeah, no, this is a, a similar tool they used um, it, during their um, what was called the representative areas planning process. Um, it, it's a similar tool. Um, it, it was kind of invented in Queensland, right there, and and, uh, and so the, the the early processes that they used, uh, they used this tool early on, but. Um, one of the lessons they had, you know, as, as they'll tell you, is that, that this all, you know, as they ran Marxan over and over and over, it, it didn't provide them the, the answer. What you needed to hear from was that you had to get that local knowledge. And, and so while it was, it was something, uh, for them they used it as a starting point, the lesson, you know, learned out of it was get the local knowledge first, and so you're not wasting a lot of you know, time or, or providing, you know, you know, have Dan show up there and, and and then you just throw darts at what you see up on the board. It, you, you start with a more organic process from the local knowledge from, from you guys, from the advisory council and working groups. And, so, and, and then use it to evaluate that. And my only concern is other places have come up with much larger numbers. I just that question. There's a lot more work to go here. I mean, it, it, you know, if, if you look closely at the map, it, you know, we're, we're not taking over private, private property, you know, I'm not going, you know, so some of those very efficient you know, solutions and results uh, are people's islands, you know, because remember you've got all the different habitats, and so you know you saw uh, it took Will's house, you know, it, it's one of the results, you know, because that's that's you know, that's sugar loaf, or that's that's some of the. It's you know, it's not like Will's house. It's fine, uh, but you know, I mean, that's those are you know, it's it, what it's looking for is you know, where is the best, healthiest. In, in that case, um, you know, coastal mangrove habitat. I like the scientific approach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's a tool. Thanks, Paul. So, um, very interesting. I appreciate what this is, what its limitations are. Obviously, it's one piece of the puzzle, and you've got the Bob Leeworthy at all socioeconomic info, like what if we did this, what, who would it, whose ox would it grow, or who would it help. Uh, but then there's another piece, which is the connectivity question. And I know that a lot of, for example, the Tortugas Reserve and the San Luis Reserve, there's a lot of connectivity analysis that went into identifying where those were and how they should be configured. Is that a future step? And or how do you how do you tackle that? Or do we do it um, do it in our heads as a group discussion or, or what? Well, I can answer part. I think uh, Dan correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, yeah, part of the connectivity. What was built into the system. I mean, it's, it's looking for connections. Um, however, the, the larger connectivity, of, you know, when we talk about the kind of large scale ecosystem connectivity, um, that's that's something that has to get. Right? I don't know if you can actually just get that right out of something like this. It's got to be worked out. As as one of the parts of the goals that we have to do. This this is about finding that that 
There are uh, a multitude of ways to integrate connectivity directly into this decision support system. Um, I can think of at least four off the top of my head. Um, what we need to do is establish those connectivity criteria separate from applying the decision support tool, and then we can use the decision support tool to carry out that criteria. But we only carry out the criteria as it's established prior to the decision support tool, as opposed to programming the tool to build connections in. Uh, one of the things, I'll go into a little bit of it. There's a couple of different ways the tool can build connections. One is direct linkages, like this is connected to that, and you can build that into the support system. Another way is to say, build me things that are clustered together, and that is incorporated into the decision support system. So it looks at connectivity in more than one way, um, and what we would need to do is, as a group, make decisions about exactly which connectivity we're looking for, because there's several variations of what connectivity could mean. I've got a couple of people down here. Okay. Oh, thank you. It might be a two-part question. So there were a lot of numbers being thrown around. You said purely ecological is 8%? Yes. Yeah. So that means, like, no take? Is that what that means, purely ecological? Didn't make any decisions about take or no take or how the land would be, or water would be managed. Just said, if you wanted to have a portfolio of sites, that represented, say, 20% of your hard bottom area, then you would use these particular areas. And so if you wanted 20% of your hard bottom area protected and these other 235 things, you would need a minimum of 8% of the 21,000 analysis units to re reach that representation criteria. Okay, so earlier, a couple slides back, you showed all the 40 or 50 different criteria, and you put a number value next to like how important it was. So like fish was, I saw was a 50, and some corals were 30. So where did those numbers come up from? Because it seems to me like you're ending up with an 8%, and I think that the intent was to get more protection. And it sounds like, you know, if we have 10% now, we're kind of stepping backwards. Are we getting less than what we started with? We are proposing that the existing scenario be abandoned and that the purely ecolo ecologically optimized scenario from the decision supports will be adopted. So we wouldn't say, let's take this away and just use what came out of the tool. What we're saying is, if you only use the criteria that went into the tool, the minimum area that you would need to get that done is the 8%. Um, <clears throat> So in, addition, in addition to what we have, or in totality? Separate. So if you clear the board and say, if I want to reach these representation criteria, what's the smallest space? Then the tool gives you the smallest space by which that representation criteria can be achieved. It's so not necessarily the right place to go, but it's the smallest area that meets that criteria. Right. So was that one of your directives, is to find the smallest area that met the criteria? as opposed to a middle or a large area that met the criteria? I mean, this seems like that's a very small percentage. Yeah, the idea was to see what the efficient solution would be spatially and use that as a starting point for evaluating other alternatives. So we don't say the answer is actually only 8% and not 20 or 30%, but that if you wanted to do these things specifically, the smallest space is that 8%. But it wouldn't meet all of the objectives. It would just meet the, the numerically stated objectives for ecological representation. And that's part of the game, but that's not a full set. You wouldn't just say, if you could have that 8%, that you'd be golden. I'm sorry to kind of drag this on, but how did you come to these numbers here? So we started off, uh, <coughs> I've done this thing in uh, maybe a couple dozen different ecosystems, and so we started off with the general practice. Uh, this is what's usually been done in other areas. And then we reviewed that with a, a team of scientists who work on spatial optimization tools and said, is this 
the right set for this area, and we tweaked it a bit to, to fit the Florida Key scenario. Then we worked with the Key staff, and in working with the Key staff, we didn't just evaluate one set of criteria, but we established 12 different trials of different goals and size those up to say, how are these responding in this particular scenario? Which of these best fits our objectives for planning in this area? Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I just have a, a quick question. The, the, the maps that started off with like seagrass and coral and different stuff like that, where is that data? come from? Is that something that the sanctuary science provided for this? I mean, the, the foundational kind of data elements that you're using, just just because I'm not aware. Well, yeah, I mean, this, this comes from a multitude of sources, um, you know, from, you know, it's, it's, it's NOAA habitat data that's been um, put together over 20 years. It's a whole bunch of work done by uh, FWC. Um, you know, kind of sort of the, uh, what you call it, you know, the, 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 keep, the keeper of all of the, the spatial data, um, you know, particularly on the, on, the, on the habitat map for the keys. Um, a lot of different people contribute to it. The fish data, multiple sources. Coral data, multiple sources. Um, and is that stuff, how current is that, John? Just, just so I'm... Some of it is you know, from a year ago, um, and, and so the habitat maps go back, uh, I don't know, uh, I mean, they've been working on really 20 years, you know, it's kind of the first habitat map. But, we did you know, the first one in 91. But it's the best know, available. But it's, it's the best available. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been updated since then. We, we can get you all the sources that it, it's, just wanted to know. Yeah, it's it's in the, um, if, if you look at what the, the working groups um, had in, in the books, it's got the, all the different sources of all the data. The, the technology has changed three or four times since we started, it. and it's getting more fine tuned with each advancement. So I have a question: Is a lot of your data based on where those green dots are? meaning that the places that don't have any green dots are not factored into it? Absolutely. So it is based on where the information occurs. There's a benthic habitat map which covers most of the area of the Keys, but not all of the area. So areas that are outside of in situ surveys and outside of the benthic habitat map are basically blanks in our information. So we're just not able, we can consider those, but as far as we know, there's nothing there, which probably isn't true, but there's a limit to our knowledge. Any other questions? He just had his hand up. Pete, I'm sorry. Got to wait for day one. So, understandably, there can't be hundreds and hundreds of alternatives, like you mentioned, Sean, it's got to be grouping. But because it would be helpful at this time, I don't know if you can even answer this now, but it would be helpful just because of discussions with stakeholders we're having. Can you give us a type of an example of what an alternative may be? I mean, is it going to be when the first round of alternatives comes out with the DEIS? Is it going to be very generalized? Say, for example, one alternative would be there will be 12 new man wildlife management areas, or will there be like, specifics on a map? Say, for example, the Tavernier Key Wildlife Management Area will be changed this way. So real general or specific, can you just give us an example? I, I guess, if I understand it correctly, it's probably going to seem more general. Um, we grouped them a little bit more by goal, um, so that in alternative one, you, you will you will see a map that says, oh, okay, maps. The, oh yeah, oh absolutely, where the, the, you, know, you will, similar to, Similar to what you got coming out of the working groups, where you had those yeah. the, the, the maps that show, okay, very specifically, here is where you know this working group has proposed this activity. If, if it was a you know a no motor zone, something like that. Now, so you'll have a whole series of, of alternative one, you know, and, and then in alternative two, maybe there's nothing there, and, and, you know, in peak key or 
you know, if a, maybe, it's, maybe it's bigger or smaller than alternative three. But those, that's kind of how we group it based on the different goal. We're not completely there yet, but it, like I said, it's iterative well, yeah. with, with some of these tools. Oh, that's helpful. Dan, some of the point data there, you know, was set up to be gathered at a, at a point. So you go out and you dive down and see what's there and get your information. Other, other of those points were set up in uh, probabilistic sampling design. So the re visual census for the fish, the reef resilience program, disturbance response monitoring data, the screen team, um, Stephen Miller et al. data were designed so that you would go out, because you can't visit every reef, you'd go out and visit a subset of the reefs and it was done in such a way that by sampling those places, you would know something about all these with a margin of error. So my question is, do you take into account um, what that, those particular data sets tell us about the whole ecosystem or just what's at the points that were sampled? In this scenario, the latter, we took advantage only of the knowledge of the survey at the point and did not extrapolate spatially. So, I mean, obviously, those particular sample protocols and the effort that goes into them, they were designed to provide information about the ecosystem. Um, and I don't know what it takes. I don't understand MarkSan well enough to know if you can get the, the analyses that cover all of the reefs in those subregions where the data were collected and use that. But it would be a, it would be using the data as it was intended instead of using it the way that you're using it. I'm not saying the way you're using it is not valuable. I'm saying uh, there's another way to use it that's valid, and that's why we did it that way, and it's, um, it's sort of state of the art. I would agree that there is the way, there is that approach to applying the information that we didn't choose that would be a uh, valid methodology. So we could do some things like, uh, like uh, the creeding or the inverse distance weighting so that we extrapolated from the individual point survey to essentially cover the space uh, with a broader, what's essentially an estimation. Um, and that would possibly lead to slightly different results. It should lead to pretty similar results. Um, but we haven't tried it in this case. Uh, it'd be interesting if we had the capacity, meaning the time and the money, to, to do it that way. Uh, I'd certainly be interested. Um, so I think it's a valid methodology that we didn't apply. Thank you, Chris. With some of the, you know, for the, the reef resiliency, it has been put, kind of put through that sort of analysis. We used as, it was used in that in that sense though, because it's already been processed for lack of a better term. Yeah, in, in that sense. The resilient reef states. Yeah. No, so, yeah, yes. Yes. So it, where that has been done, it was used. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is really cool. Any other comments or questions at this point? So it sounds like you had more to go. I, or there was one next step slide. Did you want to cover next steps? I, I kind of covered you know some of the next steps, but uh, just to give you know folks a sense, that, you know that that's at, at each meeting we're trying to give you a sense. Of this is what we're working on right now. Is we're developing the draft environmental impact statement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've still, we've got to package all of this up, do that analysis, and then um, start coordinating amongst the agencies uh, uh, in, 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 to, to put together the, the, the draft, like an admin draft, environmental impact statement, and then there's a whole bunch of people that are going to be, you know, touching it and reviewing it before it's actually public. But, you know, we'll continue to be providing more information as it's developed to the advisory council uh, uh, as, as we get there. Um, we're, we're, you know, the last meeting I talked about spring, um, so that's what we're going for. Uh, it, it, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, the, you know, the, the timelines, uh, it, it's affected by, you know, how fast we can get work done. And, 
and get it reviewed and coordinated amongst the agencies. But you know, we're going for something around there. And, you know, give you another update in two months and see where we're at. But you know, there's a, there is just a heck of a lot of work um, going into this. Any questions about kind of process, uh, timeline? Yeah. Anyways, that's what I said. Ben, you've been eerily quiet, so it makes me nervous. I'm jet lagged. I yeah. just got back at midnight from, uh, from the Canary Islands, and you guys are lucky. I'm um, taking it all in. I'm I actually I'm, I'm impressed with it. It's I'm still mad I lost those two years of my life. Today. I'll get over it. No, I, I understand. I understand why we went through that process. Nobody would believe what we're talking about if we said these are the spots. And it would definitely probably have affected us in making some decisions because you would see those hot spots. So I think it'll be, it will be interesting to see where that overlap is and, and whether we, we did a good job to what the computer model says. And I think all of that is, is going to be interesting as, as we get to see more and more of it. I see the number little two point being a struggling point, but I think you guys know that and going through that. And that's why we're looking at spring or summer-ish or October-ish or whatever it develops into. You guys got a lot of work still. A lot of work on your guys' end still. So. The kids will be growing by then, man. <laughs> um, you know, what Ben kind of pointed out, bullet number two, that, you know, what we're showing you is a lot of the qualitative stuff. It's, I'm not saying it's easier. It's definitely uh, very complex in terms of the model, and, you know, where you can apply the numbers and the science and, and do that. The, so the, so the hard, you know, the, the qualitative side of, you know, is this more enforceable than that? Uh, it, you know, what, you know, how many buoys does this take versus, you know, to marking this area? That kind of, that, that stuff takes a lot of internet process, and that's you know, what we'll be going through. Um, we did, I uh, did want to, I guess, kind of leave it, and Beth can pull this up. Um, we, we did uh, make some, up, also some updates to the website. Um, uh, for for forty keys, I know what I know, but, but, you know the specific marine zoning uh, website, and we think uh, hopefully made it uh, a little bit easier to understand in terms of kind of process and, and ability to find uh, the work that folks did, and, and so just great work by by Beth and Rachel and Mary putting this together. Uh, All right. For, uh, can you take, take can you hear? Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to go through um, real quick high level. Um, as Sean said, we have revamped the entire pages for this marine zoning and regulatory review process um, to try and make it an easy go-to place where everything is there. Hopefully people can find it. We've maintained the pages for the working groups because people did use those a lot and we wanted to maintain the information and how it was and where it was. Um, but I'm just going to go through high level here. This is our homepage, floridakeys.noaa.gov. And then to go to the regulatory review pages, there are two places. You can click right on here, this marine zoning and regulatory review map, or I think it's still here. Oh, under the advisory council, you can find the working groups. But I'm going to go from the highest level so click on this map, and this takes you to the home page for this process. And our key points here are these three elements where you can find more information. So about the regulatory review, gives a little background about this process, gives information about our current step, where we are in this process, and then two things. One, at the bottom here, you can open up each of these, can open up further to give you more information about the steps to date. You can find information about what has happened. And then next steps, right now it's just a little summary statement. Eventually these will become, have more information as we move through these steps. So you can find that there as well. We've made this timeline, steps and timeline, where each of these, you can link to that step in the process to find out more information. 
And the dark blue is where we are in the process, and the light ones are still to come. So this is just a general page about the process. You can go back to the home page here. This link just links to the goals, objectives, and principles for this overall process. I'm not going to open that page. Those have not changed since you guys agreed to those back in 2012. Finding notices and documents related to the review. This page here are, is the, will be the compilation of all the federal notices and documents. So again, that timeline that was on that other page. Here are the steps. This is where we are. And this is where you'll be able to find all the truly formal federal process documents. So the, the documents that get us through this process, the condition report, the notice of intent for scoping comments, um, the outcomes from those scoping meetings and scoping comments, and then as we do have a draft environmental impact statement, and as the other documents come out, this is where that, those documents will be found and compiled. So hopefully one easy place for you and the public to access. Go back. This page, advisory council, work plan, and working groups. This really is the heart of the update and the heart of the information. Um, I'm not going to walk through all of these, but this is where your work plan, the nine priority items are listed, the additional items you identified you wanted to look at through this process. And then down here is where those four working group pages are maintained as they were throughout the last two years as the working groups were working and information was being um, built and developed. But each of these priority items, I'll choose permit procedures and adaptive management. You click on any of these, you can go a little bit deeper into what is the summary, what is the issue, what is being looked at for this topic. And then here, we talked about these issues a lot at our meetings. And so here's where you can find the relevant advisory council meetings, the agendas for those meetings, and minutes for those meetings, and presentations that were given. You can also link to that the larger documents that you guys got that were compilations review for these issues, you can also link to those pre-meeting material packets on each of these pages. So each of the nine priority items has its own page where you can, whatever issue you're interested in or your constituents are is interested in, you can send them there where they can see, okay, what is the issue that the advisory council is looking at and advising the sanctuary on, and what information has been presented and discussed, any decision items related to those, and uh, background materials. Back to the main page. And finally, the big, other big element is how you can get involved. How the public can get involved and how people can find out more information. And up here there are three or several bullets for how you can get email updates, how you can reach the advisory council member, how you can attend advisory council meetings, what events are going on, and how to follow. So that's generally the the updates to the pages, um, hopefully they're useful for you guys, hopefully they're useful for the community and the public, but that is a compilation now of everything that has happened pretty much over the last three years since the 2011 condition report. <coughs> Any questions for Beth? Great. Well, 
Right. Um, we were scheduled to have a public comment at 2 o'clock. We were running late, but I don't, haven't seen any names. So unless there's somebody that wants to make a public comment, we'll just finish up with agency reports. All right. I'll give it to Sean. Um, we've had a, the, the, the one thing we've really been working on that, that I wanted to highlight was the obviously the 25th anniversary stuff. Um, um, other than that, I wanted to quickly go over the fact that uh, at our last meeting, some of the issues we've been talking about, I, I said I was going to be giving a talk in front of the FWC's Voting Advisory Council. Um, I was in St. Petersburg. Uh, last week talking to them about some of our kind of general zoning stuff that uh, they had on their agenda uh, uh, two things that you know we've been following and you have been following uh, one of uh, one they had a pretty extensive discussion about uh, the congregation of vessels uh, and and uh, and so they they as I said the last meeting this is definitely kind of a statewide issue uh, that they that they've been looking at um, uh, they, they've been primarily looking at it more on the public safety side, so it was a really good discussion when I was there about some of the resource impacts. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be getting from them is all the presentations and the kind of the materials that they went over at that meeting. And so you're going to see that come out from me out to the advisory council. You guys can kind of review that and see how you know, other people are looking at different things. I, I can say that in a general term, FWC. Um, uh, you know, they, they look at their role as kind of, um, uh, they want to facilitate local agencies uh, coming to local solutions. Uh, and, 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 and they kind of stand ready to help. And so that means if a city or county has something specific, uh, from, you know, they, they want to be able to help out and, and make sure that, that they, they can do that. And I think that makes sense. Uh, they're definitely kind of different, in, in different <coughs> issues related to congregation of vessels around the state of Florida, and, and, uh, and uh, it's an interesting topic on the side as well, because it would make you be scared for the rest of the state of Florida just as much as us. Um, the other issue that they, uh, you know, that they took up was kind of a report out on uh, the public meetings they have around the state uh, uh, addressing the derelict vessel uh, problem. And, and as you guys recall, I had sent out to the advisory council, uh, the, the meeting they held in Key Largo um, about the, the, them kind of really taking a close look at their own vessels. That um, they would give a report out on that. I'm not going to kind of go into all the findings that they have, but they are definitely looking at more solutions to address the DB problem um, and at risk vessels. Vessels that are not quite yet on the seafloor, but are almost there, or, or you know, and the problems where they can't find the owner or. You know, this thing uh, has got a bunch of hazardous material on it. And, and I think they, they've done a heck of a lot of work on, on that issue. Interesting statistics. Um, uh, and and, and it, it was, it, they've been a little bit proud to be there. Uh, oh, very proud that, that, that with the meetings all around the state, uh, the, the highest turnout uh, was definitely the Keys meeting um, for the Derrick Bus. So I'll get that information out to you as well. And, and then further information on how to plug into the, the voting advisory council as they look at this. It's it's run by uh, for official Island conservation commission, the division law enforcement, and um, and uh, they, they're, they're looking for input and they're always interested in these issues. So just wanted to report out that I did kind of follow through on on, on what happened from the last meeting, and, uh, and and that conversation is kind of continuing at the at the state level on the statewide issues as they try to address it locally around the state. Um, John Hunt, I have to read very quickly from John Hunt. So I've, I'm now John Hunt, uh, <laughs> agency <laughs> report. He, he just wanted to report out, so it's going to sound like an FWC report. So, uh, but John Hunt wanted to report out, the FWC is taking up mutton snapper management at, the, um, at their meeting in November. Uh, this, is, this will be an initial discussion regarding possible bag and trip limit changes during the spawning season. Uh, if the commissioners uh, approve, if, if the commissioners approve staff developing options for consideration, we can expect a series of public workshops during early 2016. To learn more, go to myfmc.com and access the commission meetings link. So 
obviously an issue that's been discussed many times in advisory council and in particular. All right, with that two done. Joanna? Um, on behalf of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, I've got a couple updates. So uh, last stack meeting, I gave you an update that uh, Miami Dade, Broward County, and uh, even going into the state national park is experiencing an unprecedented coral disease outbreak. Um, I'm somewhat happy to say that we've not received reports beyond that. And so it, as far as we can tell, um, we hope that that is the extent of the outbreak. Uh, we are still continuing to track and receive reports, um, and this particular outbreak was particularly concerning because there's multiple species of coral and multiple types of disease. And so we've seen large outbreaks before, but never kind of the scale and um, as many different species being impacted. So stay tuned uh, for information. We anticipate that we're gonna have some data coming in from the Florida Reef Resilience Program surveys uh, that were done for this season. Uh, as well as some supplemental information that we were able to fund. Um, we hope to have some idea of what the, what the expanse of the outbreak looked like sometime with preliminary information coming in November and more detailed analysis coming later in the hopefully December, January timeframe. Uh, quick update from Penny Camp uh, State Park. Uh, keep an eye out in the local free press for the new section called Nature's Corner. Park Service it has staff and volunteers are going to be discussing a variety of nature-themed topics. So it's just a new uh, way to uh, provide outreach to the community. Also, the Key Largo Hammocks Port Bougainville uh, Restoration Project is one step closer as the project has now been put out to bid. The contractor will be chosen in early November and demolition expected to start by December or January. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is a really big hit in the ground. We <laughs> did a lot of big restoration and this is a really good step forward. The, uh, the final update I have is I wanted to actually take a moment to introduce Karen Rosak, who is sitting here a little away for me. So most of you guys know my role for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is that I oversee all of the Florida Reef Act from Martin County to the Dry Tortugas and the two programs that DEP has that work on coral issues, the Coral Program in the North and the co-management of, of this National Reef Sanctuary. Uh, Karen is starting as of October 1st, transitioning from my coral program in the north to be my eyes and ears on the ground here in the sanctuary. She's going to be based physically here to help strengthen and expand the state's management role. Uh, so she's also going to be taking on the uh, management of the two aquatic preserves that are down here, Coupon Bite and Lake Bite. They haven't had direct management for a couple of years just due to historic budget cuts. And so we're really excited to be able to bring her in and have her expertise in uh, expanding our management of those resources. So please feel free to reach out and say hi to Karen. We'll be sure to pass out her uh, contact information. And it probably won't be until January or February that she's done her full time. But we hope that she'll be based somewhere in the Key Largo Marathon. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 really quick. Since you brought up the coupon by aquatic preserve, something I've been trying to find out is if Picnic Island is included within that aquatic preserve. It's right on the boundary. On the maps, and no one seems to know. You happen to know? I don't know offhand, but I can get that information. I, don't, I would love that. I don't think it would. I don't think, I don't think it would. Really? Yeah. I don't think it would. No. Hmm. But either way, people follow. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think the next name on my list is both for FWC law enforcement. Thank you. And for those of you uh, who have not noticed yet, I am not Captain David. Uh, <laughs> He's got hair. Yeah. Yeah. He's throwing his out now. <laughs> uh, we did a reorg back in August, um, so part of that reorg is I have the uh, Sanctuary Squad, uh, Josh and the uh, Scotty and Steve Bolden, uh, and Josh's crew and the uh, Gladding, um, along with several other things. I'm also the investigator captain for Call Your Date in Monroe County, uh, and dispatch, and the office. <laughs> uh, but uh, I should have prepared a brief bio, but uh, from a personal side, uh, born and raised on the water in South Biscayne Bay, Old Cutler 152. Um, 
who started fishing here in the early 70s with my dad when there were wooden catwalks on the bridges and only one barn at Tavern Creek Marina. So I, I've been in the Keys a long time. It's been a passion of my uh, family and myself. Graduated at FSU. Uh, no. to I don't know. Went to the academy, started Monroe County was my first choice for the Marine Patrol. Started here in 89, so I'm in my 26th year. Was here as an officer in the Upper Keys from Dade County Line to the Marathon for most of that 12 years. Went to Tallahassee the headquarters, did a lot of stuff up there. My last three years in headquarters, I was involved with the South Atlantic Council, Gulf Council, um, LEAP, Law Enforcement Advisory Panel, and Law Enforcement Committee, so a lot of interaction between different working groups, and so I'm not totally unfamiliar with uh, the process. Um, left headquarters, ran the Caribou office, uh, you know, Appalachia Cold Bay. So I know firsthand issues of water flow and what they can do, saltwater intrusion, predation, uh, the oyster industry up there is devastating. And I just found out from our head attorney that I've been named in water boards. Uh, so I have to go give a depot up there for that on the way back. But uh, been back in the Keys about a year. Two of my children were born here in Monroe County. So I'm not a comp, but they are. So I have a passion for it. Um, so you might be stuck with me for a while. <laughs> but uh, Sean took some of my comments back. I was looking at the uh, notes from the last meeting of 19 page document. Eight of those pages were focused on the, uh, the voting conversations. And I won't say too much about it, it's probably been, been beat around, but you know, just, just remember, uh, and it's, it's always good to have law enforcement involved in any rulemaking process or, or rule recommendations because it helps manage expectations. Um, you know, if we put somebody in the sandbars, everybody behaves. But then there's another group, you know, Bill Kelly and the, you know, the commercial fishermen. Well, all they do is babysit the sandbar. They don't care about traffic uh, because we're not out there. Or the guys' association. You know, they're always at the sandbar, but nobody's chasing these jet skis away from you when I'm trying to hook up a bonefish. So we're spread thin. Um, you know, I saw a lot of comments in there about, you know, we can handle it ourselves. Some of the, some of the local people in there, but uh, it's tough. Vice Marlin Beach was handled because the association there came up with money to pay the sheriff's department to be there. So they weren't technically on duty having to patrol. They were dedicated to White Marlin Beach. Um, and then once the beach stuff settled down, then they complained about the parking. So they hired another deputy to sit in the parking lot and control the parking to the beach. But uh, you know, unfortunately, we can't do that. I've had lots of people come to me and say, why don't you do anything about the boats anchored in Tavern Key? It's like, they can anchor there. No, they can't, they can't have a boat with a motor in there. So no, they can't motor in there. But again, we have to sit there, watch somebody actually motor in and motor out. And again, there's another user group that feels like all we're doing is basically the same part. So enough about that. Um, but we've done, a, taking it from a public safety point, we've really stepped up our DUI enforcement and uh, I think our numbers are nearly double this time of year what they were last year, um, statewide, but uh, certainly in the Keys. So that sends a message. Um, but yeah, it's, people are still gonna party. They come to the Keys and they think it's, it's what you're supposed to do down here. Uh, we'll deal with it. Um, that's about it. We've been uh, happy that the boat's running. <laughs> Josh is happy. I get to go to the Tortugas and patrol. Uh, our big focus right now, of course, is you know, our voting season slowed down, uh, so our big focus is on track running. Uh, we could do a lot, of, a lot of work on that, making a lot of cases. That's it. Okay, go ahead. You know, just a small, small point. Uh, okay. Uh, just a small distinction. <coughs> on, in the White Marlin Beach situation, the uh, the subdivision, the, the community that hires the deputies is Port and Tegel, right. and not White Marlin Beach. But both White Marlin Beach and Port and Tegel share that stretch of beach. 
where there's uh, terrible things that happen on uh, holiday weekends in the summer. Um, Heather Blau with uh, Noah. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. I have a several federal fishing items to report. Since we last met, the Gulf Council approved their action to increase the recreational minimum size limits for a bag and red grouper to be consistent with those in the South Atlantic. They also uh, voted to change the recreational fishing start date for, uh, to June 1 and to eliminate the fixed December season closure. And they begin work on a new action to also increase the commercial minimum size limit um, to the same level. The South Atlantic Council has identified their five preferred alternatives for their spawning area management amendment and Warsaw Hole off of the keys is included among those. They set a control date for the commercial dolphin fishery and began work looking at establishing trip limits in that fishery to slow down the rate of catch. And they continue working to develop a number of rebuilding plan alternatives for the key stock of hogfish. And those include increasing the minimum size limit, reducing bag limits, establishing commercial trip limits. And they're also looking at a fixed two month seasonal closure for for hogfish. The, their scientific and statistical committee is meeting this week to weigh in on both the hogfish amendments and the spawning management area amendments and that meeting is open to public participation via webinar if anyone's interested. Both councils have agreed to move the Yellowtail actions out of the South Florida amendment into a separate standalone amendment to try to get more traction on that so we're hoping that that will pick up speed. Um, the South Atlantic Council will hold public hearing webinars on Yellowtail, the Dolphin Action, and their spawning uh, management zones in November, and they could take the final action on those at their December meeting at Atlantic Beach. Both council councils have also agreed to split their joint amendment that would require charter votes to report electronically, and the Gulf Council could take final action on, on their amendment as early as their January meeting. A few weeks ago, we notified both of the councils that Spiny Lobster has exceeded its catch limit this year, and so that will trigger the requirement for them to convene a review panel to determine whether any corrective action is needed. The Gulf <coughs> Council has proposed that the two councils get together their APs to suggest measures before the review panel picks this up, and the South Atlantic Council will consider that approach at their next meeting in December. And last week, uh, the Fishery Service approved the South Atlantic Council's proposal to shift two and a half percent of the commercial dolphin alloca allocation, uh, two and a half percent of the allocation to the commercial sector. So that will increase their quota by 35 percent. And then finally, we have a few items open for public comment. Through November 6, we're taking comments on a proposed rule that would increase the Gulf King Mackerel Gillnet commercial trip limit modify electronic reporting requirements and implement a user visit permit in that uh, permit provision in that fishery. Through November 16th, we're taking comments on a proposed rule that would allow recreational fishermen to bring back dolphin and wahoo fillets from the Bahamas. And then through November 2nd, we're soliciting proposals for Salt Stall Kennedy funds uh, for grants and cooperative agreements related to fishery research and development projects. And interested people can apply online for those at grants.gov. And that's all. <coughs> hey, song? Hello? Yeah. All right. Kenny Blackburn, uh, Can you Blackburn, Special Agent. Wait, 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 wait. Couple more questions here. Uh, uh, so <coughs> the other thing, so that's coming out of the South Florida Amendment yes. into something else, but the action is still giving yellow tail to the state? No. No, what is the yellow tail? Um, there's several. There's several alternatives. They're looking at combining the ACLs. They're they're all alternatives based on making um, management more consistent. But the delegation alternative is gone. Um, I have a list here of all the different actions that they're looking at. Delegation is not one of them. Thank you. But the other species are still being considered for delegation. The uh, black grouper and. 
whatever the other South Florida amendment species were? So they're all still in the South Florida amendment, but that, you know, it's not been moving very quickly. It's not really clear how much is going to happen with that. Now lobster, we've already hit our lobster cap for the year, this year. That's a marathon. Wow. <coughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. I just had a quick question. You said next week is the, was that the webinar about the spawning of the hogfish? That's that this week, actually. That's, do you know what day that is? Um, I don't have it readily available, but I have it somewhere here in my notes, so I could look that up for this. <laughs> I think it's a three day meeting, probably Tuesday or Thursday. I'll check. Any other questions? <coughs> Don? <Scott? coughs> uh, what is the number of the cap for lobsters? You know, I think we're. Seven million. Seven million pounds. Yeah, I think we're about five hundred thousand over the cap, if I'm recalling correctly. Okay. Thank you. It's it's the it's the target catch level that we're over. We're not yet over the limit. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Hey, Kenny, you uh, want to go next? I can. I think you have microphone. <laughs> Kenny Blackburn with uh, Genoa Fisheries, Special Agent um, here at Marathon. Um, this morning um, we had a Key West uh, warrant, uh, arrest warrant that was executed in Texas for Ammon Cavino. Um, if you remember correctly, Ammon uh, was the director of Idaho Aquarium and we had prosecuted him about two years ago for <coughs> taking sharks and corals and a bunch of other marine life from the sanctuary and uh, he was selling them in violation of the Lacey Act. So um, he got a year and a day, and part of his uh, probation and parole was that he stay out of the aquarium business during that time of his supervised release. So, um, um, you know, people don't understand a lot of our job doesn't just end whenever we make a case. Um, we always have to continue after the sentencing, a lot of times even while, while the people are in prison, um, you're still dealing with the with the person. Um, you deal with them to get their cooperation to help them get out of prison. Uh, and then a lot of times after prison, uh, when they're on probation, um, we we are you know we're a small agency, and we also have to do our due diligence to make sure that they're um, cooperating with their conditions. So um, this is one that we received information and uh, we took the information and. It was, uh, this is Fish and Wildlife, NOAA, and, and the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, this was turned over to uh, a judge who found a probable cause was, was there, and a uh, arrest warrant was signed out of Key West. So um, that happened this morning. Um, other than that, uh, we had a few um, summary settlements within the, our last reporting time um, out of uh, the captain's men over there, and um, we helped process those. But those were strictly um, done by our JA partners. Um, and that's it. Okay. I think uh, anybody from EPA or National Park Service? National Park Service, Chris is here. Chris. Okay, so you did it. All right. Good job. Thank you. I've seen you. All right. I'm uh, microphone. I'll go to the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Cavanaugh with the Everglades and Dry Tortugas National Parks and a marine ecologist at the Florida Bay Interagency Science Center in Key Largo. It's been pretty busy in Florida Bay this summer. And so I guess the report I can give is uh, the current status of the bay in the Bay. Um, we've learned about the seagrass die off and <coughs> From the estimates we could we can make um, several thousand acres of Alaska seagrass in north central and uh, western uh, Florida Bay that are dead or dying in place uh, at this point. So 
specifically, that's for those of you who know today, uh, Rankin bite, near Gar Garfield bite, uh, and Johnson Basin, Johnson Key Basin. Uh, in Rankin, the estimate is 75 to 85 percent of the seagrass is dead. And in Johnson Basin, more like 60 to uh, 60 to 75 percent at this point. Um, <clears throat> so we know that from uh, several agencies uh, responding, and that includes the uh, water part of the uh, South Florida Water Management District, uh, FWC, the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute out of St. Petersburg, uh, FIU, and um, and NOAA have also been a part of the discussions and concerning the response. Uh, why did it happen? Uh, mainly a lack of fresh water, uh, but it was a combination of high water temperature, uh, <coughs> delayed uh, seasonal rainfall, Extreme low dissolved oxygen and, um, and high sulfide concentrations in the bottom waters. So, just to clarify a little bit, uh, you probably read in the newspapers about the yellow haze or substance uh, that was transitory and generally uh, appeared during those extreme conditions. So I went out, well, I did go out last week, and didn't see any of it in the lake. But it's, um, um, but it was generally associated with high concentrations of sulfide, which were uh, in sampling of WRI has been uh, running the measures and are extremely high levels in the sediments and pool water. Um, levels that are toxic to uh, see the uh, The dissolved oxygen, um, basically near Bowie Key, we have a, a, a monitoring station. It went hypoxic back in August and has remained that way pretty much through now. There's very little seagrass to be putting oxygen into the water, and there hasn't been a lot of uh, mixing this summer. Uh, Garfield bite uh, also went hypoxic in September and has rebounded intermittently. Uh, and then we see varying levels or periods of hypoxia, low dissolved oxygen in Johnson. We're keeping our eye on Whitbury Basin, uh, which has not been affected as of yet. However, we've seen elevated um, chlorophyll, chlorophyll aim, uh, readings, and so we're watching with that for now we're doing uh, possibly so the result was um, a lot of dead seagrass debris and litter on the bottom. Um, this is large, thick mats of it. So also floating on the surface and um, collecting around the basins or well, the shorelines and keys out there. And this is on the scale of kilometers square. So a large amount of biomass, dead seagrass matter, which is out there in the bay. So our concern is that this will uh, decay and then cause <coughs> nutrients into the water column and initiate other things. So we're continuing to monitor for that. Uh, we 
are also uh, monitoring areas uh, with benthic surveys to see whether uh, the, the seagrass style is proceeding. Um, so they generally below Johnson, which is Little Rabbit, the Rabbit Key, Basin, and Whitgrave, which is below Rankin. The seagrass is still healthy, uh, but we picked up some signals of the high salt bottom uh, on the fringes of those basins. So we'll continue to monitor and, um, and then we'll continue to make biological assessments and determination as to whether for highly impact, impacted areas uh, if we need to make closures or other recommendations. So that's uh, the state of the day at the moment. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. All right, thank you, Chris. I think we'll probably be discussing the bay a little bit uh, at our next meeting. It seems like there was some interest in the bay now. Um, is Bill Goodman, I thought I saw him here earlier? Yeah, he is on the mayor. Okay. I think Ed Barham, you're one of the last, and then if any of the mayors would like to make a comment, um, you can do that last. So, Ed Barham from the Navy. Um, we, um, we're partnering with the Fish and Wildlife Service, our National Geographic, <laughs> and PBS, they're doing a uh, documentary on the endangered species, and they selected the Motor Keys Mark Rabbit as one of the five species they're going to do this documentary on. So they'll be down in January filming on the base, which will be pretty interesting. Um, we have a large pod of, of, of manatees in one of the canals on the Sleepy, our residential area. They've been there for a week and a half now. Um, unfortunately, we found that we had a dead manatee watching to our boat, the Chica Marina, a few weeks ago. Um, it just appeared to have been picked by boat. Um, and lastly, last week we um, we conducted a spill drill um, for a uh, uh, potential fuel spill. Um, you may not know, but we store <coughs> five million gallons of jet fuel on Chumbo Point, about a million gallons on Boca Chica. So this was our worst case scenario drill, where the scenario was one of the full fuel tanks ruptures. So in this scenario on Boca Chica, we could have had a potential of 240,000 gallons of jet fuel. Um, Escape the tank and the ground. So we uh, we do a tabletop and then we deploy. Then the next day we do a practical drill. And Coast Guard ferry DPs there. Um, in a real scenario, which hopefully uh, we'll, we never have, obviously sanctuary and um, Sand Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission would be involved and involved in that. But the drill went really well. Um, we exercised our movement strategies and everything went well. Um, one thing that was interesting with the really high tides we've had, we, we have to tweak some of our, our plans now <laughs> because uh, some of the areas we thought would be dry are you know, six inches underwater. Mm -hmm. Is that the rabbits? It will. I mean, they, they can swim, but they, <laughs> they need some dry land. All right, thanks for that. Any, any of the mayors want to make any comment? Are they still here? I see. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, the council for uh, having the mayors be involved and being uh, having a voice here representing their communities. And uh, I think we'll be an asset in the future. Uh, and I think I'm really going to enjoy uh, being part of this. Uh, Actually, it's a pretty amazing day. This is there. Everything has been discussed, and uh, we've all been discussing it for years, and uh, I just uh, come on board here recently. But uh, I think we all have the same goal, protect this uh, wonderful environment that we all enjoy. So hopefully, it could be an asset to it. It's nice to see you here, Craig. Craig and I have been friends for a very long time, and uh, it's, I think it was very wise of us to, to bring municipalities on board and participate, have a greater countywide education and understanding of exactly what we do here. Uh, I sat on the 
back for, I think I'm in my 18th year now. And I, it, it's uh, mm -hmm. that reef out there, our water, our water quality, issues that we're dealing with. And having lived here for 30 years, I watched the evolution of, of being able to sleep on US-1 or in US-1 uh, from September to December. Now we have a full-time economy and the impacts are quite apparent from the, not only on land, but also on the water. And I think it's something that we need to be paying very, very close attention to as to the incursion into our residential communities. Uh, the area that uh, Martin is talking about is something that uh, uh, has, has created concerns for me and a lot of the folks who have that type of incursion into their residential area. And I think the potential uh, it is there for it to become worse rather than, than better if we can't figure out some kind of solution to deal with it. Uh, this year, as we went through our budget, uh, we set aside $100,000 for Sheriff Ramsey to put an officer on the water to have his eyes on the water and address issues, specifically derelict vessels, which cost us two hundred, approximately $250,000 a year to, to deal with. Uh, Bruce Poppin and I were just looking at uh, our, uh, on the internet we, that uh, California has just passed uh, a much more stringent rule in dealing with derelict vessels. And, uh, hopefully, maybe we can uh, do something that uh, becomes a little more aggressive than the way we've been dealing with it in the past where that $250,000 could be going to more of law enforcement officers either from the state level or uh, from the local sheriff's level. But anyway, uh, Craig, Mayor Cates, it's uh, great to have you here. And Jerry Ellis from Key Colony Beach was here earlier. and uh, So I, I think that's a great addition to the Sanctuary Advisory Council to have the municipal participation. All right. Well, do you want something else? Can I just a few this answers? Running into your minutes on the next meeting. Okay. <laughs> just a quick answer, a quick answer for people. The SSC meeting is Tuesday through Thursday, so you can find webinar info on South Atlantic Council's website. Finding lobster uh, catch target is 6.6 .6 million pounds, and we're at 7 million pounds. And the eligible actions that will be in the separate amendment are uh, catch limits a new fishing year start date and commercial and recreational allocation. I wanted to mention we're very close to meeting the commercial yellowtail ACL, so that will likely close early this year. And that's it. Thanks for the extra time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so unless there's something else that I'm missing, um, next, uh, our next meeting is in December. It's here in this room. Traditionally, up until last year, we didn't have a December meeting, so we didn't do it. But up before then, we kind of always had a covered dish dinner party like thing. And uh, so I asked Sean about it. And because we're in this facility, I don't know what the rules are on doing anything like that. But we're going to look into either getting permission to bring stuff in here or finding another place to have a party afterwards. Or maybe something else could happen. I don't know. We're going to vote. We're going to vote. We're going to vote. We're going to Well, that was, that was brought up. We're going to vote on tears. We're going to get to bring your own bottles. Yeah. It might be a lot of fun to have a, a little uh, friendly gathering. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to work on that. Yeah. We'll get back in. In the big paint booth. A big what? The big paint booth. We're putting together the first annual Florida Keys Bug Show. And we're on a real short time frame on it. It's going to be the 21st and 22nd White Air Fair of Blanco. We're going to have dealers from all over the Keys. And we're going to have display space available. If anybody wants to display, we're going to hopefully have some space available for, uh, for uh, government agencies and stuff. We'll do that also. Uh, we hope we get the community behind this and make this an annual event here for Marathon. We, we think it's a, it's a great opportunity for the community to have a, a really nice event like this. It'll be a destination event. That's November 21st and 22nd, the week before Thanksgiving, right here at Fairwater.
Cool. Thank you. All right. All right, let's go home.